Okay, so again, welcome everybody. Uh, as Robert said, Pete Pellegrini here with the War Gaming uh, Department at the Naval War College. Uh, so this is going to focus. Is this is sort of like Stephen Hawking's a very brief introduction to the history of time. This is going to be a very brief introduction into kind of how to go at or how we think at typically at the college war game design. Um, so uh, other possible topics for future discussions. And again, this is kind of an ad hoc thing that Robert put together based on that Robert had attended our. Uh, a wargaming course at the college. Uh, so there's lots of other things we could be talking about. Uh, and down here, you can see some of the things. Uh, I got problems, you got problems, we've got problems. And that is essentially uh, looking at problem statements because we use problem statements quite a bit in our design work here at the college. Matrix gaming is very hot, um, but it's not as easy as it looks. Uh, other things uh, down there, you can see Pandemic Tempest was a war game that I did for uh, Dartmouth College. And it does represent a good non uh, kind of military type war gaming as a design study because it was based on an earlier design from the National Defense University. So uh, with that, we do have a couple of caveats that we're gonna talk to here real quick. Um, again, this is one of those uh, federal uh, disclaimer I'm required to put out that everything you hear from me is from me, not necessarily those uh, lies or opinions of the college, the United States Navy or the federal government writ large. Um, this really is gonna be about one hour out of what is a week long course at the college. So you're not gonna get turned into master game designers here in this short period of time. Um, there's gonna be a lot of things that you may have questions about thinking, oh, I thought he's gonna talk about this or that. I, I probably would have if we had a week, but we don't. <laughs> so uh, again, we'll, we'll try to catch some of your questions here towards the end. I'm gonna to try to leave about 20 minutes when we finish. I'm gonna be going nonstop, okay, uh, for the next hour plus here as we go through this. And um, as you see, chat's been disabled. Please hold your questions, as Robert said, and we'll try to get to your Q&A at the end. Uh, and I said before, the Zoom session is being recorded. All right, so the very first thing that we need to kind of jump into is addressing this idea of what's, uh, because you hear all the time, tabletop exercise, training exercise, workshop, uh, uh, bog sad, bunch of guys sitting around a table, uh, war game. Well, how are these all different? Are they all the same thing? Uh, and in some cases, there is quite a bit of overlap in the nature of <clears throat> what we're trying to get at or how we're trying to approach it. Um, probably the two biggest areas that we, we hear all the time is exercise. They would look very much so the same. From the college's perspective, my perspective, um, what we're really trying to differentiate when we get into exercises is this idea that um, the an exercise or a training event is something where you already kind of understand what the outcome ought to be. You have the sense of training standards, you have the sense of proficiency, and these events are designed through repetition to improve the participant's proficiency at meeting a standard level of performance as a classic exercise type environment. Wargaming often is we don't know. We're trying to explore and understand, and that's the power of wargaming. But even within that wargaming context, then, part of the challenge we have is where the people are focusing on the war word in wargaming, uh, in which case we will call these people later the reductionists, so the folks that I call in the reduction camp, versus people who are much more focused on the game part of it, a game about war, or the abstraction camp. Uh, and we're gonna, we'll pick at those more a bit later, but somewhere in there, we need a definition of wargaming. And the definition the college uses comes from Frank and Q. Frank was a longtime wargamer at the college, served for over 30 years. And Frank's definition is kind of our Bible that we go to. And it's this idea that it is uh, a conflict event. So we're gonna look at selected aspects of a conflict situation, selected aspects. We're not gonna try to game everything all facets of everything that we're looking at. We just can't do it. So we're gonna purposely focus on parts, so selected aspects. Um, and we're gonna play this out in accordance with predetermined rules. And we'll talk about later about this idea about free play and rigid play in terms of rule sets. But imagine trying to play a game of chess where if you sat down, you didn't know the rules and you were just gonna to try to figure out the rules as you went along. And clearly people who understood the rules are gonna crush you. And you're trying to learn the rules by trial and error. It doesn't help to play a game if you don't understand the rule sets and parameters that's being played under. So we're going to predetermine those. And this thing comes into a conflict when we have people who are essentially subject matter experts 
who are using an internal implicit rule set, the rule set built in their heads over years of experience, vice something more concrete like a, a combat result table, lookup table, something that you'd provide, you'd find any uh, game you'd pick off the shelf at a toy store. So selected aspects, predetermined rules. And why are we doing this? The purpose of a gaming is to provide either decision-making experiences or decision-making information. Broadly speaking, these have been kind of shorthanded into decision-making experience equals education gaming, decision-making information equals analytic gaming. Um, that's a little of a gross oversimplification. Uh, and what gets lost in both of those shorthands is the word decision-making. Decision-making is central to everything we do at the college in terms of how we approach a game. So the, if I don't have humans that are fully engaged in making decisions as the driver at the core of the game, I probably don't have a game environment. And we'll talk about that, what that could be if it's not a game environment. Now, sometimes you'll also hear people referred to, especially at the college, as left side, right side. What we're talking about is this diagram. People on the, quote, left tend to see the value of gaming in its decision-making experience for the people who participate. That's me. I'm a left sider. Okay, less so to, on the right side are people who see the value of gaming coming out of what comes from the game, which can be then communicated to other people, typically not participants, to inform their decisions about something else. Okay, that would be the right side in the analytic camp. Um, historically, since the days of Kriegspiel, war gaming was designed for the left. It's only been in the latter half of the 20th century that we started doing it for the reasons on the right. And probably one of the biggest differences here, and so we're going to play with my tool here. So the biggest difference is on my, this side, the value proposition is for the people who get exposed to it. On this side, more often than not, in the world of the Pentagon, this is money. Right? This is where gaming is trying to be used to inform acquisition decisions, uh, doctrine, policy, training, et cetera. And because of that, it tends to be where most external agencies focus their efforts in terms of contractors who provide wargaming services. They tend to be provided primarily for the reasons on the right, less so on the left. Because on the left, in some ways, you've got to have a, you've got to have a student body, so to speak. Who, who is it participating? Who is it you're training for? And usually it's the services who run those for their very own junior and senior mid-class people than it is for external contractors. So I'd say that right now, out there in the wargaming world, there are a lot of people who are providing, trying to provide the right-hand side. Uh, the services internally tend to provide the left-hand side for their own efforts. So what you got to key in now on is the, the pieces parts here in terms of it's about dis people. I've got to have people involved making decisions. If no decisions are made, we've got to get, ugh, we, we don't have a very captivating activity. And finally, it's got to be in some sort of competition or conflict environment. So the kind of the key words we always keep we're circling back on, people, decisions, conflict. I don't care which other definition of wargaming you use, as long as those are pieces, parts of it, you're getting at the heart of what we mean by uh, wargaming. Now, wargaming starts to get used for everything. Uh, and the way it's structured, remember I just said it's about people and decisions, and people are squishy, soft, organic computers that spit out inconsistent data over time, and they're very qualitative in nature. Okay, we are very qualitative. So activities from a gaming perspective that can benefit from that type of qualitative approach are things that games are good at. So when we're trying to get at and investigate and understand how decisions are made and processes, trying to organize ideas, find gaps and seams and issues with the way we approach and look at problems, explaining the why. Games are great narrative tools to help us understand the why behind things. But they're not good at producing what a lot of people want games to do, which is come out with outcomes, okay? predict winners, prove. I have a new theory of warfare and it was proven in a war game. Mm, yeah, no. Okay. And the producing numbers part, we argue that by and large numbers are input to games, not outputs of games. So I, I tell the story of years ago when the Tomahawk cruise missile was first becoming available and people wanted to play it in a game. 
And so for gameplay purposes, we had to give it some sort of performance numbers. Um, and at the time, again, there wasn't a lot of actual employment of the weapon to understand its actual field capabilities. So we had engineering estimates, we had test range material, that sort of thing. So we had to come up with a number. So for the purposes of gameplay, we said 70%, that the weapon is 70% effective in terms of hitting what you aim at. We play the game. Uh, at the end of the game, a junior officer was overheard saying, wow, that war game, it looks like Tomahawk is about 70% effective. He's misinterpreting the fact that, yeah, in the game, you tended to hit seven out of 10 things you aimed at because that was an input, not an output. But that is not unusual where, especially in large complex games, people confuse what were givens in the game as actually having been derived by the game and proven by the game and then they want to run off and make decisions based on that. Worst are basically when games become vehicles for propaganda, uh, the, the people start looking at the game environment and thinking that the game is somehow real and that its analogies with the real world are a one for one correlation. And therefore what happens in my pretend world, um, sort of like the Truman Show, <clears throat> That, that somehow is reality and make decisions based on that. Uh, there's a case over here in the, and we say concealed advocacy. There are some games that are designed such that you are supposed to win or lose. That's the point. Um, there was a game that was developed called the Somali Farmer Game. And the Somali Farmer Game, uh, you'd go and you were asked, hey, you're gonna be a Somali farmer. And this is an electronic game. And you're going to try to do things, and the object, object of the game is to see how long you can continue to produce food for your family. And as you play the game, you're exposed to drought and crop failure uh, and uh, banditry and crime. And it, no matter how well you tried to farm, you couldn't get past about three seasons before your family was in a famine situation. And you lose. As a matter of fact, you had to lose because the point of the game was then to set you up for a, see how hard it is to be a farmer in Somalia? Won't you help? Click here to donate to a relief agency that was trying to provide funds for Somalia. So the game was not meant to try to understand uh, in terms of finding solutions for uh, challenges in agricultural uh, endeavors in Somalia. It was, or the outcome was predetermined. Okay. You were designed to fail so that we could make a point, in this case, with building empathy. Uh, similar games have been played with, uh, by uh, defense agencies when they're trying to convince people that you've got to buy a new weapon. Okay, Because they'll play the game and the new weapon will be amazing and it'll kill everybody and say, see, we need this new weapon. So these are advocacy events that are not a genuine good use of wargaming. Um, I've got a whole discussion, uh, not for today, on bad wargaming, uh, how not to do it and how to spot it when it's happening around you. So we're gonna have to have a little bit of a language here uh, so that we're kind of somewhat on the same uh, page in terms of uh, terminology I may use. So when we talk about purpose in wargaming, typically what we're trying to talk about is back to Frank's diagram, left side, right side. Are we primarily talking about a purpose uh, around the educational side, meaning that the people being, uh, being made to play the game are the chief beneficiary of it because they're getting exposure to problems, they're getting exposure to decision-making under some sort of stress environment. Or again, are we trying to pull information out of the game such that we can inform somebody else's decision? There's obviously overlap between the two. Scale and scope. When we talk scale and scope, we're really talking about in the case of uh, scale, the breadth of the game. Is this a game which is just, we're looking at a war game around a small operation uh, in a relatively remote part of Afghanistan in a village, uh, for example, a very tactical level problem? Or are we looking at uh, World War II from a global perspective in a very strategic level? All right, that's kind of the, the scale problem. The scope is the depth in terms of how many layers deep are we gonna go? Um, is this a game where it's sufficient to say that uh, we're employing a carrier battle group or do I need to represent each ship? And within each ship, do I need to represent departments within the ship? Do I have to represent individual weapon systems on that ship? Now we're kind of getting into the level of detail or granularity. The number of sides. This is usually expressed in sort of a one-sided, two-sided uh, kind of expression. One-sided gaming is fairly easy to wrap your head around. It's kind of more or less where somebody is the training audience, somebody is playing the game, uh, and the rest of the effort 
uh, the umpires, the control teams, the white cell, et cetera, are really just kind of focused on presenting that one lonely little team with problems. Uh, and they're just constantly throwing more stuff at them. So there really is, there's only one group of people who are making decisions that matter, and it's that one player group. On the other side, then you can imagine, well, two-sided game is fairly straightforward then. That's a blue side and a red side where both sides are free to make whatever decisions within the boundaries of the game in order to advance their victory condition and try to defeat the other person if that's what the victory condition is. Now we get this sloppy thing in the middle. You'll hear people talk about one and a half sided gaming. And really what that tries to do is it leaves blue as blue, like in a one sided game, it's just blue. But that red entity that's supposed to be providing that adversarial friction for them to, to uh, bump up against is been kind of co-opted. They've been kind of pulled into the control or, or the white cell environment. And so while they look like a free playing adversary and they've got some room to maneuver, they're kind of under the thumb of the control team in order to make sure that certain objectives are met. The amount of information that's in the game gets referred to this as idea of uh, open versus closed intelligence is usually the way this is re 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 phrased. Open Intel games, are chess. You look down at chess and you see all there is to see. There are no hidden pieces below the board. There's nothing in someone's pocket. Everything there is to know about the game is knowable. It's seen by everyone. On the other side, closed gaming then is you only get to see aspects of the environment. You only get to see perhaps as far as your radar sensors can detect or where you've got uh, overhead imagery to show you parts of the map. Closed intelligence games are usually the primary reason why we start getting into the whole roles of white cells and adjudicators and that somebody has to decide what is seen on what board. These are what we call three board games. There'll be the red board where red is seeing the red view of the world, the blue board where blue is seeing the blue view of the world, and then the white board or ground truth board in the middle. And it's up to the umpires to determine what from the ground truth board appears on the red and blue boards. Obviously, computers make this a whole lot easier, but obviously you can do it through manual systems as well. But that's when we talk, when we say about, is this an open or closed game? That's what we're referring to is the intelligence and how much you know. Method of adjudication. How are you gonna determine the outcome? Adjudication should be nothing more than the adjudgment adjudication of the rules. Within the rules environment, you made a, you made a decision, they made a decision, I put the two decisions together, I apply the rules, and I determine how the environment has changed as a result. Now, the rules I apply may be simply a group of experts who have gathered up in that team, and I've got a, maybe I've got an old submarine commander who spent 25 years in nuclear submarines, and he looks at that situation and kind of mm, mm, hums and haws and looks at it and thinks about it, reflects on his personal experience, his expertise in anti-submarine warfare, and decides, yes, I think the P-8 would get the submarine in that event. That's free. I'm just using experts to look at the situation and based on their best judgment, are coming up with answers. Rigid says, ah, I get rules for this. Okay, I've got explicit rules written down. Okay, if the submarine is in water less than 400 feet deep and the P-8 stays on station more than three hours and then it's a 22.8% chance and I roll the dot, they do or don't get them. Those are rigid rule sets. Now, in some ways you think, oh man, free sounds a whole lot easier. Yeah, it is. But the, my core problem with free, very flexible, handles a lot of situations that you may not have thought about. But the problem then becomes the expectation and differences between the player's expertise and the adjudicator's expertise. Once upon a time, when most uh, folks in the military were all exposed to various combat uh, and had a lot of level playing field, I'll, say, I'll call it, in terms of experience in actual combat situations, that kind of works. But now we have very different camps in terms of this expert in the cell up with the player cells is saying, yes, it's, it's unrealistic to believe that a red submarine would ever do that. Meanwhile, down in the, the adjudication team, they're saying red submarines do that all the time. It's like, well, who's right? Because you both can't be right, but I can't have the, these two rule sets banging against each other any more so than I can say I have one player thinking that the rook goes in the orthogonal on a chessboard and somebody else thinks it goes in the diagonal. It just doesn't work. Right, so even in free situations, you gotta be thinking about how that's gonna impact your rules and your play. The basic simulation technique, okay? At some point, the game becomes artificial. When I say artificial, I mean that we don't have players doing everything. 
So uh, in a typical war game at the quote, operational level of war, I'll have players representing various commanders, but at some point, I'm gonna get down to, the, to the, the, the tactical level because in a war game, in the end, all war games, war is fought by young men and women in killing machines. Everybody else is a bureaucratic layer above it. So I'm gonna to have to somehow represent the actual friction and impact of war machine on war machine. And who's gonna do that? How are we gonna do that? Are we gonna do it through a computer simulation? Are we gonna do it through uh, some sort of board game? I mean, board games are manual simulations. Your classic hex encounter game is a manual simulation. Um, how are we gonna do this? Spreadsheets, automation, uh, simulation, computer programs, artificial intelligence. How are we gonna handle the parts of the game that aren't handled by the player is what simulation technique tries to get at. And finally, probably one of the toughest things to mess around with is time. How does time move in a game? Is it that it's one for one time? So every minute in the game is a minute on your wristwatch and that's what we're doing. It's just running, it's called running time. The time just runs and it's in one to one time. Then there's running time where the game, the game clock is going faster than real time, two to one, three to one time. While this always seems attractive that, oh, you can speed things up, humans are hardwired to one-to-one -to -one time. I can't look at you and say, hey, the game is running at five times speed. You need to think at five times speed. It doesn't work. So that's handy to get past things like just watching ships drive from point A to point B. But when we get into tempo of gameplay, often running time at accelerated time overwhelms the humans. Because again, they can't think faster. You have to give them either less to think about or tools that uh, help them to arrive to decisions quicker. But the physical process of thinking is what you're wired to and it's one-to-one. -one. Or we do move step where the clock stops, okay? Almost every board game environment, any of the game where it's an I go, you go, there's no real sense of time. It's that while you're thinking about the move, the clock isn't moving. I've updated the situation. It's zero eight in the morning. Here's your tactical intelligence. Here's your battle space updates. Here's your intelligence reports. Um, you have until 10 o'clock to put in a move. And from eight to 10, nothing happens. The clock in the battle world is frozen. So nowhere in the middle of that, you suddenly get a report about how the enemy did something. They can't because the clock is frozen. And it doesn't start moving again until you turn in those moves, adjudication evaluates them, decides that eight hours have gone by in the battle space. Here's where all the pieces parts are. I give it back to you and the clock freezes again. So it's, it's moving in steps. And those may be consistent steps, long steps, short steps, they may vary between the games. The, the icky part here one is this format concept. It's like, well, what's a format? Usually what we're talking about is how are we arranging the humans? Are we gonna put all the humans in one room and have them sit around one big table and talk about it? Or am I gonna have some humans in one room, some humans in another room? The players will be separated. We're gonna have pretend circuits that connect them. Um, or are we gonna across the country? Are we gonna sit there and put some players in Virginia and some players in California? What is, how are we gonna arrange the humans to do the play thing? That's what we mean when we start to get, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about how you think about that. Um, but probably one of the things that you really got to get cemented before you jump into game design is what's the objective of what you're doing? What is it you're trying to design a game for, right? And this is the sense of purpose and objective. And usually games talk about both. Usually you'll have a problem statement, separate discussion, then a purpose statement and an objective statement. And too often you look at the purpose and the objective and they like they read the same. It's like the purpose of the game is to explore implications for the new command and control structure. And the object of the game is the command and control structure will be explored. It's like, wait, what? The military mind thinks about purpose, method, and end state in terms of the commander's intent. And so if we start with that, and then we look to see how game purpose and objective maps or doesn't map to military purpose, method, end state, when we think of purpose as being why we're doing the thing we're doing, be it a military operation, be a war game. Why are we doing it? Method tends to be how we will do that thing. And end state is what we expect to see when we're all done, okay? the objective at the end. So game purpose and military purpose, 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 why, that seems to map just fine. But when you start hearing objectives which are heavy verb based, we're gonna explore, we're gonna investigate. I have a whole discussion about how I dislike those words because they're very ambiguous. But that's very verby. And verbs are usually associated with method of action. So your objective, if it's verb-based, is typically more about how you'll do something and not about what it is you're trying to get to. So 
I prefer objectives in games that are much more end state driven, which we call the SMART objectives. S-M-A-R-T, simple, measurable, actionable, relevant, and timely. Simple and specific. I've gone to service games where the objective for the game fills a PowerPoint slide. Oh my God. I cannot possibly wrap my head around what it is we're trying to do. Okay. It's got to be much tighter than that. Measurable in the sense that I've got to be able to turn to the sponsor and say, I did or didn't do what I told you I was going to do with this game. How will I know the players did what I was, the, the game set out to have them do if I can't somehow dis distinguish, differentiate the players at the end of the game from the beginning of the game. Every board game has this. You all know what the victory condition is for a board game. Otherwise, how do you know who wins? All right. So you've got to have some sense of measurable objective that's got to be actionable, meaning that you're not asking them to make cold fusion over the course of a week. Okay. There's just no way that they can actually do that given the tools are typically available within the game environment. And it's got to matter to the people who play the game. Right? There's nothing worse than people who are forced into playing a game because their command said they had to send somebody and you were it. And you don't care about the objective. It's really hard for you to engage in a game that you don't care about. And finally, timely. There's got to be something that has a sense of the, that we typically don't game for things that we're going to uh, accomplish 100 years from now. Because it's so far out there that the relevancy and, and ability for people to wrap their heads around is pretty, pretty poor. So we try to game much closer in to real-time horizons. Sorry. So an example of a weak, elect, uh, weak objective, and I see these all the time, you know, review and discuss. Okay, review and discuss this mythic op plan 4200. Uh, okay, that, how about participants understand the interaction of all organizations during the execution of O plan 4200? At least now I understand what, why we're doing this, what we're trying to get at. Um, classic example in terms of the corporate world is uh, companies that are wrestling with a to update or to improve their uh, uh, sexual assault rules and, and uh, uh, sexual misconduct in the workplace. And they'll come up with an objective that simply says, review the company's uh, uh, sexual uh, conduct rules. Okay, I guess we can all what, thumb through a book, look at the cor corporate PowerPoint deck, but if you're actually, if you say, well, why do you need to do this? Well, because we had an incident and our HR department handed it poorly. And in the state of California, this can result in substantial fines and other court action. It's like, oh, so what you're really trying to do is to ensure that everyone understands the reporting process. Is that specific to this case? Yeah, it was the reporting process we gooned up. Okay, that's much different than review our sexual harassment policies, right? Trying to get more specific, trying to get more measurable, trying to get more focused on what you're trying to accomplish. So from that point then, we have what we typically uh, use in the college is this sense of, uh, anal uh, we call analysis upfront in terms of our war game design. So we always start with this sponsor question. Somebody's got a, a question. There's a reason we're doing this game. What, who are we trying to help out here? Who are we trying to inform? What's their problem? Why is that a problem? Why is that important? It's understanding the sponsor's external rationales for having this game. Then, we're gonna have to understand, well, if that's your problem, then it seems like the, the best kind of thing I can give you to help you address your problem is what? And in the case that like we did a game for the medical community, the Navy medical community, what they were really looking at was trying to come up with a prioritized list for investment. Where should they spend their money? Uh, in, a, in a variety of different areas. Okay, so I don't know what's on the list yet, but at least I know I'm trying to make a prioritized list as the output. Then I'm gonna start saying, okay, so if that's the kind of thing they want, where does the information come from to fill in that kind of answer? And if the answer is go do a literature review and look it up in a library, well, then we don't need a game. So I've got to begin to sense for what kind of information am I gonna to have to collect that's gonna allow me to generate information that's gonna help me help the sponsor. And how am I gonna get that information again? So. So what sorts of places can I get that kind of information from? Straight up research? W where do we get this stuff? Um, what type of process, again, typically generates the sort of data I'm looking for? It may be discussion and maybe, but you gotta get a kind of, kind of feel for it because what you wanna do is make sure that you're headed towards a valid game, a game that's actually useful. And then right now we ask the question, how are we gonna analyze the output? There's nothing worse than running a big game than having no idea what you're gonna do with the data because you never plan for it. You didn't plan to how you're going to collect the data. You didn't plan on what you're going to do with the data at the end. You didn't plan on how you're going to report it. We do this. It's called the, the DCAP, the Data Collection Analysis Plan, which we do right in the beginning. Okay? 
Now we get into the part where we say, okay, so given that that's what the sponsor is looking for, that's the nature of his problem, that's the information sets we need to generate, can humans do this? Can humans in a decision-making environment playing a game actually generate this sort of insight? I was asked by the National Reconnaissance Office about doing a war game to try to figure out the best mix of low Earth orbit satellites and Earth or an air breathing assets like Global Hawk to provide persistent SA in the battle space. So situational awareness. <laughs> well, there's no game there. That's an engineering problem. That's a math problem using uh, ops analysis, ops research approaches to optimize some sort of constellation based on certain physical requirements. Now, if you're saying that given we have this constellation and the adversary begins to attack it and take down certain parts of it and certain information sets are lost to the commander on the ground and how that would influence his decision making and how he prosecutes a conflict, okay, now I'm interested again because that's humans making decisions in a set of contexts. But to come up with a constellation in the first place, that's not a war game. Problems and or objectives, information that's generated by an activity and we're going to have to analyze. These are the five key parts when we talk about analysis up front and game design. Problems, objectives, information, activity, analysis. So how do we generate this stuff? How do we play? Right? This is, in the end, this is what it's about. It's about play. And play revolves around, in most cases, kind of an ends, ways, means approach, at least from a wargaming perspective. So you're going to have some sort of resources available to you, military equi equipment, money, whatever the game is, there's a resource, there's some sort of means that you're going to try to apply through a strategy, a ways, to meet an ends, a victory condition, right? I got to be gaming for some purpose, right? I need to have a sense of why I'm doing this game. Now, the players typically don't get to make decisions about all that, okay? Usually they can't change their minds about the end of the game, all right? Oftentimes it's, well, this is the victory condition, right? Capture the king, get to the end of uh, millionaire acres in the game of life. That's the victory condition. You can't decide halfway through the game of life to go, eh, I think we're going to play for some other reason. So that's pretty much so stuck unless that's your game objective to explore alternative outcomes to a conflict. The means, maybe you can give them some, some wiggle room. Um, usually the forces available for a conflict, uh, immediate forces available are dictated by deployment patterns and what's right there at hand at the point of contact with the adversary. Maybe other stuff flows in later in time. Or maybe the point of the game is to give them the opportunity to make some choices, to pick some stuff. Maybe, maybe not. But finally, the ways. The ways is really what the player gets to dig into, to how he will do this. How is he going to imply those means to meet that end? So, as I said before, decisions, decisions, decisions. As complex as we are as humans, we only make three kinds of decisions from cradle to grave. Whether, which, and ifs. That's it. Whether, which, and ifs. Now, it could be really meaningful, complex, whether, which, and ifs, but it's that three categories, okay? Whether or not to put on my blue pants or my khaki pants is a simple yes, no question. Whether or not to employ nuclear weapons against China is a yes, no question. It vastly different outcomes and complexity, but in the end, it's yes, no. Which questions are selection from an option? Having decided I want a new car, which car do I buy? It's a selection problem. And then ifs are the conditionals that we set up where we try to decide when will I act under what conditions? And for example, I will choose to buy that stock in IBM if it falls below uh, uh, $800 a share. Then I'll buy, right? So those are conditional sets up. Now, how we make all those decisions is typically a function of some sort of input process and output, in, do, out. So you've got to understand how in the military or, or the, whatever the context is of your game you're trying to make, decisions are going to be made. We call them the decision chains. Usually one decision leads to a decision leads to a decision kind of thing. And so if you can understand that chain, then you can start, start thinking about how do I construct these little bits and pieces <clears throat> and put them in a game environment, which gets us to this point here in terms of you have to decide which decisions are the important ones for the players to make. There's tons of decisions you can make, but only some of them you're gonna be interested in. And you don't want players wasting game time making decisions that don't contribute to your objective. And you don't have to limit yourself to real life. We'll talk about this again about abstraction versus reduction. Um, you can have them make decisions, you can have them do things that aren't part of quote real life. Um, you can have them take a survey in the middle of the game, okay? No combat commander stops in the middle of prosecuting the enemy to take out, to take a form, all right, and fill out a survey. You can ask in a game to do that. That's not real life, but you can ask in a game. Ultimately, you have to keep asking yourself, yeah, but if I put that in the game, 
does it help me understand the problem I'm trying to address? Or is it just kind of, well, because that's the way we do it in real life type of arguments. So you've got to understand <clears throat> what input you're going to provide for the player to make their decision. Then some sort of activity that they're going to go through to make the decision. But having made a decision, that's nice, but it's in their head. Until that decision becomes tangible in some way that that decision can now be reflected in the way orders of battle, the way forces move in the battle space, the way um, a form is filled out, an order is given. There's got to be some tangible output that then can be compared to the adversary's output and put the two together and figure out where, where the game is going. So decisions in general in a game, and this comes from Rafe Koster's uh, work on a theory of fun, have to somehow start to get at, they're going to be hard, okay? We don't want to give players in a game um, what we call the no-brainer, right? Because of its name. It's a no-brainer. I don't have to think hard to make the decision. For example, um, a decision needs to be compelling. So when we mean compelling, the player can't duck your decision. If your game is asking someone to make a decision about something and they choose not to decide it, and they can get away with it, and the game doesn't suffer for it, well, that was kind of a weak, that was a weak decision you put in front of them. So it's got to be compelling. And here in my example, we're going, we're, off to, we're going off to a Chinese restaurant. We're going to Ming's. And I want to pick something off the menu because I am hungry. I am not going to not pick something. I will pick something. It's a compelling decision. But if I open the menu and all I see is chicken, chicken, and chicken, I don't have much of a challenge here to make a decision. I guess I'm having chicken. I've got to present the player with more than one option. And those options have to be structured in some way that I can't get out of the decision by simply saying, I'll take chicken and beef. That's the two things on the menu and I can have both. Well, then I'll pick chicken and beef. I, I didn't really make a decision. I evaded having to select one or the other. So I've got to force them to put into an or situation, not an and situation. And when I put them into that competing environment, there has to be such a way that I'm not, not just using uh, one, one of the objectives or one of the, I'm sorry, one of the uh, options can't just be tossed aside because I'm allergic to beef protein. So I won't pick the beef. It's as if the option hadn't been presented. So it wasn't a valid option, therefore I'm down to one, and now it's not an interesting decision anymore. So I've got to make it such that all the options have something attractive about them, okay? And that something attractive cannot be reduced to a single criteria. Because if I can boil it down to one thing, cost. I'm gonna look for the cheapest thing on the menu. All right, I made one decision, picked to look for the cheapest thing on the menu, and that's it, I'm done. Now the rest of the decision is made for me simply by the number. So I've got to set up a situation where the, I can't just reduce everything to one criteria in order to run to, uh, to criteria on to pick something. Finally, I can't just keep asking the player to make the exact same decision over and over again. Okay, they'll struggle with it for the first time and I present it to the second time, they're gonna go, well, what's changed? Is it the same decision? Well, well, I picked chicken last time, I'll pick chicken this time. Something has to change to keep the decisions fresh, to introduce new information to eliminate some of the options, to bring in different options. Something has to keep changing to keep the decision-making dynamic. And that has to then come at a cost. I said that all the uh, options have to be attractive, meaning they have a benefit, but they all has to come at a cost as well. So I have to weigh cost and benefit. There's nothing worse than a game where there's an action which is free. Because why wouldn't I do a free action every turn? If it's free in this game to say that I am jamming enemy communications, and there is no downside to jamming enemy communications, and it's all upside, why wouldn't I jam enemy communications every single turn? Because I've, de I've developed no downside to it. I want players to have to struggle with that cost and benefit, and it better have an effect. Players hate spending all this time working through a hard decision, and you say, thanks for that, and that's it. They go, well, what happened? What's the result of my decision? Ah. Well, we're not going to get into that. Oh, you better get into that. Although they're not going to make any more decisions for you because they're getting no feedback. We hate making decisions and not seeing how they work out. The types of decisions in gaming, um, they kind of fall into some of these buckets here. Uh, there's the request type of decision, okay? Where again, um, I put you in a situation where you probably don't have enough resources and you have to decide if you're going to ask for more resources. And someone's going to have to decide to approve that or give them to you, all right? So request, approve, and then if I get too many asks, and they're all good, but I've got to start to think about how do I prioritize what people get, I've got to go through the just that, a prioritization activity, is a type of decision typical in the gaming. But remember, prioritization by itself just puts things in rank order. That's number one, that's number two, and that's number three. 
But is number one like so terribly important that number two and three are distant second and third? I can't, I can barely see them. Or are they really tight? This is the point of apportionment. Okay, apportionment decisions force the player to start thinking about how much weight to put against a prioritized list of actions they're going to take. Now, at some point, something has to act. My ends, I'm sorry, my, uh, my means have to act in the battle space. They have to somehow act, uh, and I'm going to allocate those to the problem. You see games all the time. Worker, we call them worker placement games. You have to think about where you're going to put your farmer. Where are you going to put your resources in the game? How are you going to allocate them to different tasks? To what end? Then there is the decision to act. Okay. Having said that, yes, I'm going to use the bombers to attack a target. Are you going to go now? Is now the time? Or are you going to wait? Are you going to act and tell those little tiny uh, little bits of forces to go fight? And if you've got more than one out there fighting, then you, you want to make sure that you don't end up with the pieces getting in each other's way. So often then there are decisions around some sort of coordination or cooperation type of thing, whether you're trying to deconflict them, synchronize them, or integrate them, they mean slightly different things. Uh, and finally, there's a sense of conditionals. Like I said before, we're going to allocate these forces. These uh, aircraft are going to be on patrol. However, I don't want them to attack the enemy until they cross this line between the islands. I don't want these actions to occur until the adversary does something, or I don't want them to occur until I get presidential authority. Or again, you apply conditions on top of those decisions that then prevent them from being executed unless the conditions are met. Those are types of decisions. So fundamentally, I had this hanging above my desk at the college. Fundamentally, when I design a game, I'm constantly asking myself, who do I wanna make what kind of decisions about what, and why is that important? I need to be able to justify every activity a player does in a game as being meaningful and directed towards the objective of the game. And then I gotta think about how they're gonna do this. I'm gonna put them all together. Am I gonna separate them? Am I gonna give them sheets to fill out? Do we do this on the computer? How are we gonna do this? What's, what's the how behind it, okay? So we're back to what is war gaming in terms of that sense of, um, is it about war primarily? If you approach this from a reductionist viewpoint, you see the war first, real conflict. How do we wage real war? But I'm not gonna do that in a game. So I'm gonna start cutting away bits and pieces of quote, real war to reduce, reduce, reduce what I want the players to do in investigating this problem that we created for them, which tends to leave you with a lot of real world processes that you're just trying to simplify. But they're all kind of recognizable by any officer who has served as being something that, oh yeah, that's the kind of thing, that's kind of like the air apportionment problem that we do in the Joint Force Air Component Commander. Yeah, that's kind of like the target nomination process we use. It's, it kind of looks like, kind of sort of, your day job. And then you tend to have to be bounded by that. And this is where you can potentially get a lot of baggage comes in. People will say, well, I see how you're doing your, your targeting solve, but you know, that's not the way we do it for real. I know, this isn't for real, it's a game. Okay? And people have a problem with that. We'll talk at the very end about the issue of reality versus a game. Okay? But most people, when they first try to start designing anything, uh, trying to take a, a, an environment that exists for real, you start thinking about how do I represent that in a more simplified, reduced form on a board with pieces. You're doing a reductionist activity. That's different than when you come at something and say, I don't care how we do it in the real world. Totally fresh here. Maybe I may have a few touch points from the real world, but I'm not gonna be bound by the real world as I start thinking about how we're gonna look at this problem. If you look at the game of Monopoly, Monopoly is based on Atlantic City, Charles Darrow looking at real estate transactions in Atlantic City. But if you've actually tried to find the streets in Monopoly on a map of Atlantic City, that's not where they are, right? Some of them aren't even in Atlantic City. Some of them are gone. And they certainly don't fit in a perimeter of a board and they're not next to each other necessarily. And, and where, did the, where did the utilities come from? Okay, clearly Monopoly, though based loosely on Atlantic City, is a highly abstracted form of the city. And the activities you do are, in this case, simplified, so it's a reductionist approach, in terms of buying a home. So in Monopoly, you buy a home, you flip over a card, you pay the price, you're done. Huh, there was no title search no lawyers got involved. There was no deed involved. We didn't have to wait 30 days to close. There wasn't an occupancy inspection. Well, that's real. Yes, but that's not in the game. 
because it doesn't suit the game's objective. Likewise, you're going to dump stuff that just doesn't suit what you're going after. And some people will criticize you for that because you're not being real. So in our player world, we're, out, we're trying to create a world. As a game designer, you're a world creator, right? And you're trying to make this environment where the players are going to engage in activities and they're going to learn something. They're going to, by virtue of being in a play environment, they're going to come up with something they haven't come up with in the real world. Otherwise, we could just throw you out in the real world and let you solve your own problems. But we're trying to use a different format. So think about this player world you're creating here, sort of like, the, again, like sort of like the layers of the earth, okay? At the core, you have your players. The players are the people making the decisions that matter. If someone's going to make a decision that matters, they better be a player. Right? They are your core. Now, at some point, though, we said, hey, I can have this world expand, 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 and we'll look at some examples of, of when things get kind of too big. So at some point, the players are going to bump up to the edge of the world in the Truman Show. They're going to touch the dome. And that boundary, we call the decision space boundary. Beyond this boundary is just kind of the, the behind the scenes. It's the other side of the curtain. It's on our stage where our players are actors, the center of our stage. And when we go past those side wings and get behind the curtain, we start running into stage hands. We start running into lighting technicians. We start running into the people who are creating the illusion around the players. We get, that's called a white cell, right? And we get further out, then you start to run into the, the land of adjudication where we're simply there to be the umpires. Adjudication properly run should just be umpires. You don't go to a baseball game and stare at the umpire. He's not the game. The baseball players are the game. The ump is there just to enforce the rule. Yet too often people are putting an enormous amount of attention on adjudication as if adjudication is the game and the players are just there to generate some input for them to analyze. And finally, control is the outermost boundaries. Control is everything. But control really, in terms of game execution, are the people who are worried about the administration of the game. Is it on track, on time? We get, and you have to deal with issues of, of you know, if you're playing with senior officers, you always have issues with senior officers. That's control's problem. But control, white cell, and adjudication, the words get used interchangeably. And we try to keep these very distinct roles in mind, at least at the college, um, when we play our games and structure our games. Because white cell takes different kinds of people than it does necessarily to be in adjudication, to be in control. So remember what I said earlier, we're basically looking at these little chain bits, okay? And so we've got these little decision modules, almost like Legos, where I've tried to understand that I've got a, a decision that needs to be made as part of gameplay, because I think it's meaningful, and I think it helps contribute to understanding the problem. It's got certain input to make it that I'm willing to give the players, and certain output that I need to keep the game moving. And like I said before, it's gotta have a feedback loop. So in, do, out, in, do, out with feedback. Now, it's not necessarily just one in and one out, all right? I can have, I can have bunches of ins and bunches of outs. And often these aren't just like exists by themselves. This is why we call them a chain, because one widget connects to another widget, connects to another widget, okay? So understanding and trying to map this out, you can imagine this is almost like a giant whiteboard drill with sticky notes where you're trying to understand the flow and connections between groups of people and the sorts of decisions they're going to make. And what you're really going to want to focus on is this idea of, okay, so I got all these, I got all these decisions, Roger, but now what sorts of these decisions, okay, are these all within the player's realm of possibility to make? Or some of them are going to get pushed off to the side and either I get the wrong people to make them or who do I need to make them? But the very first step then is what we're asking ourselves or what sorts of decisions are the players expected to make in this game? Then you ask yourself, who makes those decisions? You notice it's not who's the game for? Well, the game is for uh, senior military leaders. Okay, what's it about? Well, no, back up, back up. What's the game about? Who do we need to play it? Oh, seniors, mid-grade officers, people with a State Department background. I mean, you don't start with who you're trying to entertain. You start with your problem, what you need, and then you go find the types of players who provide that knowledge base. So who's going to be in your core making the meaty decisions? And then what sort of information do they need to make those decisions? Well, who makes that supporting decision that provides them input? Who's best to make that for them? And then if they have an output, well, who typically acts on their output? 
who's best suited to do that. So this is this chain of decisioning and, and massaging and working this interconnected world to try to understand what links you're gonna show in your game, okay? When we plot all this out, the most simplest form, we call it the player cross, okay? And it's got somebody, key players here, and then some typically some sort of superior source of information, subordinate source of action. They usually act on what comes out of these guys. And then maybe lateral partners who provide some sort of support as well. Uh, where we draw this box right here decides who's a player and who's in a supporting role and the level of complexity, scale, and scope the game is going to require. So again, as I said before, if we're concentrated on the what decisions, then we can figure out the who. And that's how you start to then to say, okay, I have, a, I have this world of activity. People are, are, decisions are being made about things. And this decision feeds that decision and this is part of that. But now I have to start thinking about, okay, what do the humans look like that do that? And how do I start to map the two? And I start to bring these two purely a process chart on top of an organizational chart, if you will. And how do I start to blend the two together, okay? Uh, and then what sorts of decisions are those? We mentioned those before. So here's some examples from the college of different quickie player crosses. They don't look so much like a cross anymore, all right? Uh, Global 11, uh, this one up here, okay? This was a game that you can see that on the blue side, it was important that we had multiple layers of command, okay? So I've got the focus of the event was the Joint Task Force Commander then his component commanders, and then down from that task force commanders, then finally I get into the world of simulation, manual simulation in this case, of all our smaller task groups and widgets fighting. But this was important for the objective to have this sense of depth. On the other hand, degree is our big uh, strategic, geostrategic game uh, played at the highest levels of government. So you can see that it's a relatively flat game and the key focus is at that heads of state level. And on the, on, to a lesser extent, on the blue side anyways, then getting into some of the, com the uh, combatant commanders and the interagency part, but it's a relatively flat game, very broad in scale. Then finally down here, we've got the globally integrated war game from a uh, 20 series uh, that was played last year in terms of trying to figure out, okay, so in this case, this is more or less like our Joint Chiefs of Staff. You know, that, that highest level of military and then downstream of them, getting into the geographic and functional commanders, but that's it. There's no more players below them. Well, obviously there's a whole world all the way down to 18 year old soldiers and sailors below this. And all of that was wrapped up by a white cell function. So you're constantly bouncing around, trying to figure out what should your, what should, where should your focus be? You can make a, a map as, as we say, everything is connected to everything, but that's not very helpful. At some point, you gotta bound what you're doing. Okay, you gotta bring it in, right? And in trying to bring it in, you're gonna have to start thinking about what's the limits that I can realistically grapple in my game? Where is I gonna draw my box? Am I gonna draw my box? Uh, it's important to draw my box about here. Or you're gonna draw your box down here. You're gonna draw it this way. You're gonna make it really narrow but deep. You're gonna draw it this way. You gotta figure out where you're drawing your box. And that's your game and be, don't try to do this because <laughs> right? you can't do it because then you get this okay if you recognize this, this is the causal loop diagram it was created it's a k map created uh, representing the afghanistan con the conflict in afghanistan and this got used to uh, to to beat up powerpoint this is not powerpoint's fault okay and matter of fact, I, I give a whole lecture on the visualization of data and the explanation of things through uh using powerpoint as a visualization tool and how to use it better uh and, but if this was your connected diagram, you wouldn't try to make a game that has every one of these entities and every one of these relationships in it. You would be really hard pressed to pull this off, okay? You'd end up having to focus on some portions of it, okay? And cut out other portions or simplify parts, all right? Or take parts that weren't initially connected and find a way to connect them. That's the challenge of taking an interconnected world and where you want everybody wants to see some part of the game represent their equities and try to boil it down into the parts you can realistically wrestle with. So how do you do that? Most simply, I, I, right now I've got a little side project going on on uh, Napoleonic land warfare. I, and so what I start with is there are three elements to the Napoleonic conflict, artillery, cavalry, 
and infantry. That's about it. So I can start with those three ideas. But from those, I have to start thinking about, okay, so what about the infantry? What about cavalry? What about, what about, what about? What relates to them? What decisions would you make about them? Uh, how are they distinguished and different from the other thing? Do they move the same? Do they have the same kind of firepower? Um, what are the considerations I'll make for terrain impact on these things? And you start to just kind of build out thought trees and think about what's connected to what. And again, whiteboard drills with stickies work great. Uh, but then at some point, you start to realize that, oh, some of your parts overlap. So my parts about the uh, cavalry are starting to overlap with some parts about the infantry. And so there's some, some common links there. And, oh, I got something in down here three times. And so you start looking at this and start going, okay, so where do we start to try to trim and consolidate? And in this case, let's say that this is kind of how I made my decision. Um, so the, my, again, my play space, the parts I'm going to have players do and make decisions about is in here. Everything beyond that um, is a part of white cell. Now, be careful. Look down here. Look at this little mess I got going down here. Okay, I got a bunch of white cell. Now, now where white cell pierces the curtain. Right? Okay, so here I need to have that represented because D needs something from J to play the game. That's why J is here to feed D. Okay, um, apparently there's some core prop a core player here and they need something from B to play the game or they need to give something to B. But there's some relationship between my core and my B that justifies B's existence. Now it's B's not so important that I'm gonna have him make decisions, okay? But he's gonna be a part of the the facade, part of the theater, which is surrounding the player. Ditto here. Okay. Now why do I have this? B and H, they have a relationship apparently. Well but I, they're not important. They were important, they'd be in my play space. What's this? We got a little connection here between G and B. What's up with them? Well, the only reason G is hanging in here is because G apparently has a direct relationship with K that I need him there, okay? But if I were to decide that K belonged out, okay, isn't that important? Whoop, K is on the outside now. So imagine a game that keeps all this relationship. K makes a decision. That decision gets communicated to G. G talks about it with B, and B tells H what to do. H then feeds back to B what he did, which talks to G, goes back up to K, and K is outside of the play box now. You see what I just did? I just played a game within White Cell. The players never knew that that conversation happened. This is what we call white on white, okay? This is bad because it time sucks. Basically, I've seen large games, and this is typically a problem with large games. Large games lose track of who's in the play space and who's out of the play space. And they'll end up having one part of the white cell task another part of the white cell to do something. And the white cell isn't supposed to be playing. <laughs> if it were important, they would have been inside the curtain. So be careful. Like this guy down here, G L? Oh, L, L's out of here, <laughs> okay? L is two steps removed from the players. Now, let's take a game where I'm focusing on a maritime operation uh, in some part of the, uh, the uh, Atlantic Ocean. And as part of that, I'm gonna have a maritime commander and I've got his immediate superior uh, in that uh, area of responsibility, AOR. Now, everybody works for the president. Do I need to have the president in the game? Because the president is gonna talk to the sec def, the secretary of defense is gonna talk to the combatant commander, the combatant commander is gonna talk to, okay, now I'm interested. Combatant commander is talking to because those are my player guys. So I don't need to have the president physically represented in the game by some actor I have stand behind a podium and, and give out presidential decrees. I need to account for national command's authority and the sorts of things they would or wouldn't approve, but I don't need to represent it in a high degree of detail because it's too far outside of the play circle. Okay. So give me give, give you a quick touch on a uh, the pandemic game I mentioned earlier, pandemic tempest. So we decided that for the purpose of this game, we needed people to get sick. I can't have a pandemic game without humans, right? So, but not just any humans. We decided we were actually gonna differentiate the humans into demographic groups. So we had a demographic group that was basically called the uh, K through 12s, uh, children, K through 12. Then we had a uh, college and young adults uh, category. Then we had the basic working adult category. And then finally we had the, uh, the uh, seniors, elderly over the age of 65 uh, category. So. Those were part of our game, up on our whiteboard, okay? Now, we also knew that if we're talking about pandemics, uh, travel pathways 
are a virus's best friend. So we're going to have to represent the travel portion of the game in some way. But we, we got to have this in here. We can't really have a pandemic game if we're not going to talk about, especially the scale we want to talk about, if we're not talking about air movement, land movement, sea movement. So on the board. Likewise, in terms of things we want the players to have to wrestle with is the whole issue of quarantine. Okay, Are we going to shut down schools? Are we going to shut down business? Are we going to shut down governmental offices? All right. And then we lumped all business into like one category. We didn't get into essential. Well, we did get into essential versus non-essential, but in our case, essential businesses were considered first responders, utility providers, et cetera. And we put that outside of the ability of the players to, to manipulate those folks. But the other 75% of the business force, we, we built all this off of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, was fair game. What are we going to give the players for resources? What are their what other means? Vaccine. We're going to give them a vaccine and we're going to give them antivirals, okay, as, as part of their toolkit, okay? Then we're going to have to have, also as part of their toolkit, the medical environment. So we're going to have hospitals, we're going to have morgues, we're going to have mortuaries as part of the, the resources that the players can think about manipulating. Okay, what else are we going to give them? Um, we decided to give them the National Guard. Uh, we decided to give them money. And, but why are we planning? What's the, what's the result here? Okay. We, d we drove two ends that we were interested in, and that was to minimize the economic impact to the, to the country, as we play this inside the United States, and minimize the mortality rate. Okay, by the way, this game was in January of this year, right? So eerily priestly. Okay, but now I got to have relationships, right? So money is what you use to buy vaccines, all right? Vaccines cost. It's not like we've got a, a, a magic governmental source that comes up with free vaccines. You buy these from manufacturers, you stockpile them, et cetera. So there was a relationship with how much this is going to cost, okay? Those vaccines, I have to decide who I'm going to give them to because people who are working contribute to the economy. People who are sick don't. There's a relationship there. Okay? But some people are going to get sick and they're going to find themselves in a hospital environment. Okay, well, what's the connection with the hospitals? Well, I can buy hospital capacity. I can try to increase my hospital mortuary and more capacity by buying more resources and people to do that sort of work. Oh, by the way, the National Guard has combat support hospitals and people trained in this area. So maybe they can fall in on that part of the problem. But inevitably, some people are going to die and they're going to come out of this group and end up being connected to the mortuary rate. Now, that travel portion has got to connect to the people because that's how I'm going to stop people from moving around and spreading the disease. But as soon as I do that, I'm going to have a huge economic impact because I'm screwing with trade and movement. Okay, likewise, business, clear, clear connection there. But also think about schools. You close schools, um, and in uh, what's the statistic? Two out of three families, um, they have both parents at work, which means somebody's staying home to look after kids. The daycare is closed, which is another economic impact. The National Guard is probably going to be needed because I start closing stuff, and it gets a little antsy, I may need added security to enforce my closures. So that's a role of the National Guard. All right, what about police? Ah, we didn't put them in. We could have, we didn't, all right? What about you know third-party agitators? Could have put them in, didn't. What about things like cyber threats and cybersecurity on top of a pandemic, like compound the emergency for the players? Yeah, too much, we didn't, okay? What about the media? We did not play media in this, okay? Could have, but got a little complicated and we started running out of design time. I could have put all these in, but this is what would have happened, right? We would have to then think of how to connect and connect them in a meaningful way. Okay, right now I've got a, there's a team uh, in Europe who is struggling with this very problem, trying to figure out how to draw their map to begin game design for a major European pandemic game to be played this fall. So finally, uh, as we kind of draw down here uh, to the end of our, our semi 70 minutes or so, um, game mechanics, when we talk about game mechanics, really what we're talking about are the moving parts. So having done all this work, Okay, you're going to have to think about, we call it day in the life of the player. You've got to put yourself in the shoes of the player and say, okay, I'm going to play this game. I'm going to sit down and what's in front of me? Is it a map? Is it little plastic pieces? Am I giving them move sheets? Am I putting stuff up on the walls? What am I asking them to do? How much time am I giving them to do it? Who, you, you got to work through the actual activity, just like a director doing block and stage on the stage to figure out how the, all the actors are going to move through their parts. How are the players going to move through their part such that they can start at the beginning of the turn and then get to the end of the turn and produce what it is you want them to produce? That's player activity. What are they doing? How are they doing it? Okay, what resources are you giving them to do it? Then if you have them in more than one room, you have to think about the communications issue. Are they allowed to communicate? Are they isolated? Are there, is the communications part of the game? 
or you're going to cut communications between certain cells because that's a move. The adversary can determine, can decide to attack someone's uh, communications pathways and isolate two player cells. Communications is both an administrative function, how they're just going to talk to each other, and it could be part of gameplay. And then how is it you're going to run the adjudication part? Some games, if you can get them right, I mean, think about every board game you've ever played didn't come with an adjudication team. It's not like you opened up a box and a bunch of people jumped out and said, hi, we're here to help you play Risk. All right, and we're going to work out the, what happens when your little pieces from Chile attack those pieces up in uh, Central America. No, it rigidly adjudicates. You've got to think about how are you going to do that adjudication? And what are the players doing, by the way, while you're adjudicating? Did you send them to lunch? Do they go home for the night? Are they attending a seminar on some topic you had to make up to keep them busy while you adjudicate? These are all timing issues you're going to have to lay out as part of your game design. What happens minute by minute by every group within your game, you may create timelines. I mean, how long will this take and what are these groups doing? And that's how you try to keep everybody busy. And you have to ask yourself through all of this, am I collecting data in every cell? How am I doing it? Do I have recorders? Am I doing this digitally? Am I gonna do transcription later? How is it I'm collecting the data I'm gonna use for analysis? Bottom line, your game design is gonna explain how you get from point A to point B, okay? How is it you're gonna take players on a Monday at eight o'clock and get them to your end state by Friday at noon or however much time you had to play your games. Okay. That's the core of it. Um, people always ask me about books they ought to read. Um, it used to be like there was like next to nothing out there. Now, if you just Google uh, fundamentals of wargaming, you'll find a bunch of great resources. Uh, but many of the books, you've got to remember who the author is and what the perspectives are. So Phil Sabin, uh, Phil Sabin teaches at King's College London. Whoops, let me go back. Um, and uh, Phil, Stop, stop. Let me go back to that. Okay. There we go. Uh, Phil uses game design, the activity of game design, as a teaching tool at the King's College in London. So his book is from that perspective. Okay. Um, the fundamentals down here, uh, good old fundamentals of wargaming. Again, that's Frank McHugh's. We use a lot at the college. But remember, the college, the U.S. Naval War College, is we kind of call ourselves the apex predator of wargaming. We're big. Okay. We've been around since 1887. We've got the largest standing faculty for wargaming. We've got a 110,000 square foot building designed for wargaming. We've got a really big budget, okay? We can tackle the sorts of game problems that smaller groups can't. And understand that when you read a book like Frank McHugh's, um, that that's that perspective, okay? Our handbook, the Wargamer's Handbook there in the lower right down here, um, the, it again, tends to be a project management guide more than a design guide, um, but it will make you think through the process uh, of creating a game. Again. We get big games, we get eight months to put them together, okay? Some people get, are lucky if they get eight days to put a game together, all right? On the far left-hand side, though, the last two things I got there, rules of play. Remember, in the end, this is about a game. Yeah, it's a war game. People like to try to set separate serious games from uh, other types of games. Games are games, play is play. And understanding the human capacity for play and how that affects our brains, how we look at problems, is applicable across the board. So Rules of Play um, by Salen and Zimmerman, Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman, um, is like the quintessential textbook for game designers, uh, all of all flavors, okay? And then finally, I mentioned earlier uh, Ralph Costner's work about the theory of fun and it's how decisions feed gameplay. And it's an easy read. It's, 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 I don't wanna say it's very cartoony, so to speak, in its nature. Um, but aside from reading books, play games, play games. I spent time at a conference in Boston you know, dealing with school teachers trying to bring education into the classroom. They were having a trouble with it. And I asked them, well, what games do you play in your spare time? And many of them didn't. I said, this is your problem. You're trying to implement a toy, a tool, I'm sorry, a tool, a game, and you have never used the tool yourself. So it's going to be really hard to convey the enthusiasm and create learning objectives around a tool you yourself don't use. Okay? So play games. This is a snapshot from my game shelf. It's a small chunk of my game shelf. Right, um, and I, I steal from these games all the time. Right, Axis and Allies Guadalcanal Edition, which is now incredibly difficult to get, you know, it's like three hundred dollars a copy on eBay now. Um, has a brilliant dice box in it for what is essentially operational level fires. Wonderful tool developed by Larry Harris. I've I've stolen it. I digitized it. I use it in a professional war game. So play other games and steal from them. These games are beautiful in that they have had to synthesize and get all the complexity down to something that fits in a box and doesn't come with an, with an umpire, 
Okay, unless you're talking about Dungeons and Dragons, then you do get a Dungeon Master. And that's as close as we get to having a role that starts to look like some of our professional games, okay? Don't just rely on reality. Reality is the worst war game ever, okay? <laughs> reality is boring. Reality doesn't work. And the reason I say reality doesn't work is that if reality were sufficient to understand our problems, then why haven't we just solved them? We need to create artificial worlds. We need to create situations where we can shift and, and, and concentrate focus and abstract things and reduce things in such a way that perhaps we can get your brain to see something it didn't see before. That's the power of gaming and play in artificial environments. It still has to be applicable to the real world. Don't, ever, don't lose that part. That was the very bottom of Frank's Frank's diagram at the very bottom, it says, no matter what we're doing, it's got to be applicable to the real world. I didn't say I had to replicate the real world. I just have to have a representation such that it is relevant to the real world. Much of what you learn in school, you do not use mechanically verbatim in the real world, but it gave you the mental skill sets to address those problems. That's why you see so many, uh, like, uh, my wife is an attorney, and many of the people that end up in law school come from uh, backgrounds like mathematics. Why? Because it teaches you to think in a particular structured deductive manner, which is really handy in the law. Okay. So that's what I've got. Um, we've got some time for, I'm gonna bail out of this. All uh, right here, let's stop the sharing. Um, brutally fast. Um, Robert is out there somewhere. I think can you, I mean, I'm gonna unmute, let's just see what I can do here. Uh, okay, Robert, can you can you unmute yourself? I don't know. Can you? <laughs> I'm trying to get everybody back to playing here. Uh, okay, well, actually, here everybody should be able to unmute themselves uh, that need to talk. Robert, how about you? Can you do it. Anybody who can. Okay, now I, I see, now go. I'm to unmute. <laughs> okay, uh, we got time for questions. There's a little raise hand feature if someone's gonna wants to put up a hand or if, if you're not talking over anybody just chime in oh there we go Catherine. hi you there go. thank you so much this has been um awesome i'm uh, with the state department team and um in a group called management strategy and solutions and we're looking at um capabilities around this for the entire department so this has been enlightening and very helpful so thank you um you know one question i had and i've asked this of our colleagues as well is um do you have recommendations for where we can find kind of that run of show so you talked about the idea of having kind of a minute by minute knowing what people are going to be doing what are the next steps you know where do we find not necessarily a template but even an example of that to get a sense of how these things run and how detailed they need to be yeah so our handbook is not a bad place to start it doesn't quite get into the what we'll call the intercell actions that's what you're describing um, and unfortunately the biggest problem with the college uh, in that so much of our work is classified that we can't just dump it out there on the internet um, and, and increasingly, uh, it's becoming more and more classified. Uh, so again, there aren't a lot of great examples out there, that sort of thing. Um, actually, I have some examples from unclassified games that I touch on during the course. And, and I'll put in a plug in for the course. Um, the problem with the course right now is it's only once a year. Uh, it's in January, February timeframe. Um, we do teach it twice a year, but the second one uh, in June is for our international colleagues. And we try to keep Americans out of it. Uh, it's not so much Americans, it's English speakers. Um, if you've ever been in a situation where you're the person in the room who has a language as a second language, and that's the primary language being spoken, it takes an awful lot more energy for you to keep up. And by throwing in native speakers, you fall even further behind. So our June class is strictly for our international students uh, who are staying on for additional uh, training in wargaming techniques once they graduate from the curriculum in June. January, February timeframe, uh, Professor Sean Burns at the War College uh, is the guy who runs all of that. Uh, and again, Robert is a graduate of that class. He got a you know, certificate suitable for framing. <laughs> That's probably the best place to try to get at some of this stuff and not my my, <laughs> my fire hose that I just gave you. Um, and there's a lot more we could talk about. 
I, if again, through Robert, if you circle back to me, I can maybe get you some of the examples of some of those, those wheels and timelines for some of the games we've done in the past. That would be great. Thank you. Certainly. What else? Hi, Pete. Yeah. Pete? Hi, thanks for this brief. This is wonderful. And thank you, Robert, for setting this up. Um, I just had a quick question. I love the section about, um, I love the section about how reality is not a good game. And one of the things that I've seen uh, from a, a few games that we've run here at the State Department is we have to emphasize not to fight the game. You know, it's not meant to be reality. And we run into situations where the, and I'm former DOD, but mm -hmm. the, uh, we don't have the culture here of gaming. So it's hard to get folks for any long period of time. You know, we try to get, you know, maybe multiple turns or, you know, some period of time that you see in DOD and maybe we get them for two hours yeah. if we're lucky. And then you want to give them read ahead materials, but if it's too long, then they won't read it. Yeah, they won't read it. And if you don't provide all of the necessary context, they feel it's not nuanced enough to really uh, participate in the game. So what is your sweet spot or what are your recommendations for how to provide the necessary material, how early and how to get buy-in so people don't fight the game but still have the info to play? Thank you. Yeah, that, which is tough. Okay, so um, again, one of, the, one of the things I talked about earlier about how you know, our type of gaming doesn't necessarily work for everybody. When I can get five days you know, trapped in my building uh, type of thing, you can't. Okay, but I tell you who who is in a very similar situation. Uh, you are is a colleague of mine at uh, in the Israeli Defense Force for their um, it's the Data House Center, and he runs these really intense, um, like one day, two day games. If he gets three days, he's ecstatic. He usually has to deal with one days, one day games, and he structures them around um, a problem. And usually these are are. Uh, futures problems for uh, Israel. So they sit there and say, okay, so um, can we imagine a future based on the past? Let's extrapolate a possible path forward. And let's say that Iraq does this, Iran does this, Syria does this. You know, they, they set up a bunch of postulates. And we're looking at an environment that looks like X. How might this play out for Israel? And they get the prime minister to be the prime minister. I mean, it's fortunate the data center has this kind of pull. Okay. So and if they need to have someone representing, you know, say uh, uh, the U.S., they'll get their their retired ambassador to the United States. You know, so they get people who are really steeped in this information, um, and they play this very intense, short period game, very matrix game in style. That's a whole separate style of gaming, um, and I, I lecture on that as well. And then they sit there and ask themselves at the very end of it, and they go, "Okay, so stay in character. What did we learn?" in the last you know, five hours of going back and forth, right? Now, come out of character since we're all Israelis. And in the end, we're all concerned about the security of the Israeli state. What do we have to start thinking about now if we didn't like the way that future played out? That's the format he uses. Um, and it's, it is, again, it's very just you know, discussion-based. Um, Still sets up, so it's kind of one, one and a half sided, but um, Gore is his name, finds it very effective. And again, I can kind of connect you to that world um, if, you, if, you to, if you want to look at that format. Um, but I tell you the biggest problem with that format is you need a super skilled facilitator who's got a lot of credibility, right? And that's usually where matrix gaming falls down. The process is fairly simple. The person running it is crucial. And that's where you can introduce challenge. Now, in terms of read-ahead materials, we assume that no one reads anything. We're tired, right? We, <laughs> I don't know how many times we've printed beautiful player manuals and gorgeous, and we made websites and sent, yeah, no one went to anything, okay? They're lucky to pull out the player book, walking across the parking lot to figure out what building they're supposed to walk into, okay? So we assume that nobody read anything. Because we assume that, we've got to build in familiarization time. We hate this, okay? Um, we wish people came ready to play, but they don't. So you've got to work in some sort of move zero, all right? And even then, that, 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 that's icky too, in terms of, of how you manage this, this familiarization period. So we try to create an environment where at least they get a little bit of hands-on time. Um, what's best is to have a first move in the game that if they screw it up, doesn't matter that much. Um, so it is, it is relevant to gameplay. It is connected to gameplay. It's not a throw, it's not a throwaway move. It is connected. 
but and it gives them a chance to kind of mess around with the game tools that we have and to make a move and just kind of understand how the process works. And quite frankly, if they do it well or they do it poorly, it won't impact the game. It's sort of like, you know, when you put forces far enough apart that the first move is just trying to close the contact anyways, and they're not actually fighting yet. If the first move is missiles flying and they screw that up, well, then they're going to be behind the entire game. So we don't do that. Um, and so that's, that's a part of it. But you really have to beat them up in the introductory remarks. And this is where we go over and over again. You are playing a game. This is not a simulation. This is not the holodeck on board the Enterprise. We are not trying to create uh, an artificial world. This is not, again, on the Truman Show, okay? You are playing a game and purposefully, we have left off certain features. We will ask you to do things as part of gameplay that may not be part of your normal duties and responsibilities. Any more so than, than when you play a game of chess, you sit there and argue who you are. No, you're just this being that has control over these pieces. <laughs> And you're just gonna, you don't sit there and go, well, am I the prime minister or am I the president? You're, no, you're the player. <laughs> but part of it does go to your other comment, the play culture. There are some people who can rapidly engage in a game environment because they have a playful nature and they've played games and they kind of have that core ability. We'd say <laughs> game players are people who uh, voluntarily spend time solving unnecessary problems, okay? That's what every board game is. Every board game represents a challenge. Right. And like one of the game, favorite games in my household is called Letters from Whitechapel. It's a Jack the Ripper game. Okay. Right. Nobody lives or dies if we do or don't play Letters from Whitechapel. It is not a necessary part of our lives. We voluntarily choose to represent Jack and try to stop him from killing these five women on the course of the night. Okay. Players are, are willing to suspend disbelief much faster than quote non-players are. This is why I encourage people to play games, to become players. Right. So much of what you have to do is expectation management. Don't hide your abstraction. Don't hide your simplifications. Put them right out there in front. Any more so than you would hide the rules when explaining a board game to new friends who have come over for a game evening. You don't sit there and play, I gotcha. <laughs> I didn't tell you about the rule that says on the third move, I can take all your pieces. <laughs> you don't do that. Well, then you shouldn't do it to your professional players either. Tell them the rules. Tell them the relationships between forces. Explain that for the purposes of this game, you have decided to ignore logistics. We understand that that's not the way the real world works. However, for the purposes of this game, we are focusing and assuming that logistics are a given. Well, that's bullshit. Got it. But in this game, it's a given. The other game we play about logistics, oh my God, it'll be in super detail. And other stuffs will be givens. So you, we try to be very honest with the players and explain why we're playing the game we're playing and the abstractions that have been made and the reason we've done so. And usually we find that we get much better participation then than just kind of springing the game on them because people come assuming that your game is their day job. That's why they were invited to do their day job, not to do something else. That's why I, we had a game where uh, we had a very complex game and it had a very abstract movement tool because we were trying to make people think differently about time, space, and force in a military context. And they were crap at it. So on the second day, I had to walk in and tell the people, okay, this is as, as, as if we're having a monopoly tournament and you are a real estate developer. You sell and buy real estate in your day job. Now you've never played monopoly, but you've heard that monopoly is about real estate transactions. So you didn't bother to read the rules. And now you've come to this tournament and 10 year olds are eating your lunch. Yes, because it isn't really real estate transactions. It's really a game loosely about real estate transactions with its own rules. Some of them might overlap with the real world. Most of them don't. So unless you embrace the problem within the context of the means and ways that the game represents, you'll never get to the end and you're gonna be frustrated. And they were until about Thursday. They started figuring out, of course, by then it was too late. So I, it, it is tough. It is really tough. But again, what we found is that what we've been poor at, and we're trying to get better at the college as well, is this explanatory part. We don't explain games necessarily very well. We're just as guilty as the players in assuming that players will kind of know what to do because they're all professional military people. So they should know how to fight. Yeah, but they're not fighting. They're playing a game. How do they translate 
what they know about war fighting into this artificial environment we call war. Long answer didn't help. <laughs> what else? Anybody else? We got a few minutes here. Hi, um, this is Danny Homestead. I'm from uh, Sock Pack. And um, one of the things, and this was very informative. I've, I've been to a couple of the war games at the War College recently. And uh, one of the things that, um, you know, that we struggle, that we're kind of, I won't say, this is me speaking again, non-attributionally for Sock Pack. <laughs> um, but it's some of this high operational level competition problems where time is very ambiguous and we're kind of heading, you know, and it's a whole of nation effort that we're you know, we're the small M trying to do something in this very ambiguous time frame. So, and I know some of the war games that you've dealt with, um, like last fall, kind of focused on that time frame. Um, but I guess, you know, this gave me a lot to think about and to take back to the command on how we structure that. But just curious, how, how would you, I don't want to take up too much of your time, um, but how, where would you begin to start with structuring a war game that is focused at that level? Yeah, so um, that war game you're referring to, we didn't like. <laughs> we didn't think we did it very well, right? And the challenge of that game, uh, influ influence games, what they're going to be followed by conflict games. That's competition followed by conflict. Is everybody knows conflict's coming, so no one really plays competition. What they really play is the pre-stage to conflict, which isn't the same as competition. So that didn't work so well. Um, so we, we did a lot of forensics on that game and, and a lot of issues with that game, complexity of the sponsors, shifting requirements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what we have done from our degree games, which is our, our, our more of our uh, Paul Mill game, is uh, last, uh, at, at tail end of last year, I started looking at influence models to try to understand the role of the will to fight. CNA did a study looking at the will to fight and tried to build a model based on historical cases, looking at popular support in Germany for World War II, looking at collapse of support for operations in Africa, et cetera, et cetera. And then tried to see how their model mapped on top of that. I took that model and started building one of those influence diagrams. And then started to think about the way I could quote model that from a levers and effects perspective. So now we have a model, it's untested, that tries to look at how does the populace attitude change over time? Because the populace is just, when you say the populace, popular support is just one part of a nation's will to fight. The elite opinion is important. The military opinion is important and the support of allies is important. So it's not just the domestic audience, but they are related and CNA spent a lot of time uh, trying to understand those relationships, which ones were, were um, you know, inverse relationships, as this goes down, this goes up. Um, well, how much? Is it linear? Does it seem to be more of a parabola? Does it plateau? And, and I played with creating a model that reflected all those sorts of nuances. It is not time-based. So there's no sense of, and that's the problem with a lot of games, right? You're looking at influence over time and it takes weeks, months, years for stuff to manifest. And yet the game's being played, you know, for uh, a total time of 30 days, right? It's gonna elapse in the game. Well, nothing's gonna happen in 30 days and this, this type of thing. So the model itself is agnostic of time. And it allows you to try to tune societies because we understand that, we think that say a Chinese populist, Chinese elites, Chinese military, um, and the allies of China are different societally than the West or uh, Sub-Saharan or, you know, wherever. And the model, and it only lets you do like, I think, uh, red, blue, you know, red, red and a red ally, blue and a blue ally, and a fifth one, because there's only so much I can do in Excel. <laughs> um, but within those, you can set sliders that try to indicate the degree of an authoritarian government or the degree of a liberal democracy. Is it an economically resilient country or is it an economically fragile country? Once you kind of set those relative sliders, it's all about relative, right? Because there's no magic number. You're going to go to a CIA fact book and look up and see that the economic resiliency of Brazil is four. Okay, you're, you're not going to find that. Okay, but you probably have a sense that it's better or worse than somebody else. So you can kind of set these relative positions and then based on actions that players take, adjudication kind of says, well, they did this. 
and then how does that move the model? And, the, and it comes, it spits out this pretty little, we call it the info sheet that sits there and shows over time how populace is being influenced positively or negatively and what's going on, what's driving it. It tries to make some of the soft power tangible. And this is the biggest problem that your community has in terms of manifestation in a game. When the, the special operations world is doing direct action type stuff, that's easy. They blow something up, kidnap, kill, assassinate. That's easy to represent in the gameplay. It's when you're trying to do things that are the, you know, the, the euphemistic hearts and minds kind of thing, that how does that actually get matter in a game? And this is a big problem with a lot of games. They add things that they expect to matter, but never connected it in my diagrams, okay? So this is some of the very first gaming we did at the college around uh, pure competition and nuclear weapons, right? And we were looking at post-first use. And in a post-first use world, what happens? And in this particular game, people started slinging we atomic weapons at each other. Okay, so obviously the casualties are being measured in the millions, right? Nobody cared. Nobody cared how many people were dying. You know why? Didn't have anything to do with the game's victory condition. It was not an explicit connection to what we said wins you this game. And so while you want to think intuitively, well, the politicians would be mortified. The central government would be on the verge of collapse. Maybe, huh? It's not connected to anything in the game that the players care about. It does not change winning or losing. We found a flaw in one of our games, a uh, tabletop game for the students, that one of the, the conditions was no enemy forces inside your own city. That's the way the metric was stated. No enemy forces can be occupying your capital city. One of the students figured out the easiest way to clear out the capital city in the last move is to set off an atomic weapon inside your own capital. It eliminates all the enemy soldiers in your capital. And by the terms of the game, so you're constantly having to do play testing and looking for that stuff. But this is the challenge with soft power issues. You've got to find some way to make it tangible and matter. And so in some, in some of the things that what we do is, and it may take a second order effect to get there. For, so I give you a, a, just a quick example. Things like, if you decide that popular support's turning it, so let's take a, it's the Arab street. And you would think in the game at this point that the man, the, Arab, the Arab street would be against further uh, uh, support of the United States' operations in the region. Everyone's gonna go, that's nice, yeah, whatever, okay? But when you say, and because of that, the Saudi government has now suspended military operations at Riyadh. Oh, the player goes, ooh, wait, what? Yeah. Now they care because I connected the street to the government to a military capacity the player needed to play the game. Now they suddenly care about the Arab street. But absent that connection, eh, whatever. It's nice. It's, it's fun to put on the slides about protests, okay? And no one cares. What else? Now, so point of order. Um, I see my clock down here. We got 1535. Um, actually, I'm available for a while. Uh, one of the advantages of working from home and having adult children that were gone. So uh, if people want to stay on, we can stay on. If people have another place to be, happy to pitch out. Thanks for coming. Uh, but I can stay on for a, a, a bit longer if anybody else has got interest in questions. So uh, just a, a logistical question. Um, will these slides be available to us? I missed the first two or three minutes, so I don't know what yeah, they... So, yeah, um, so we're recording, still are, um, and I'll figure out whatever that means then. <laughs> and then <laughs> It's going up to a cloud thing that's going to come back with a transcript, then we'll figure out what to do with it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yep, I think... Eric, you're waving. Yeah, one of the things that we're trying to look at now is how to incorporate advanced analytics into the mm -hmm. gaming. You know, maybe like a green team or something like that. Have you had any yep. experience with that or know of any uh, maybe yes. some so suggestions? We do a lot with analysis. Um, I've got multiple PhDs on my staff um, that have background in statistical analysis. Uh, 
so a couple of thoughts on analysis and that's not me. We joke about how it's like, I'll, I'll talk design all day. An analyst, oh my God, let's get, let's get one of the other guys. <laughs> but we do use some very specific tools, but go back to my original thing about analysis up front. So what you have to know going in is what is it you're collecting and how do you think you're going to process that data? So one of the places, uh, like we use tools like Analyst Notebook, Atlas TI, Analyst Notebook, um, probably one of the bigger ones, uh, and try to look for, you know, pour through the data, look for relationships. Um, what we, uh, we do a lot of certain, a lot, we do surveying of players over the course of a game, which can be really insightful, especially in games around deterrence and competition, because uh, I've had some fascinating games where you look at <clears throat> what uh, the blue cell thought was the state of play. And then you, <laughs> you look at what red cell said and blue is like, well, we're in rising tensions, but we think things are under control. Red cell is saying, we're gonna go atomic in the next move. <laughs> and I think, all right, but you don't find out that stuff unless you ask. Okay, and having tools that make it an easy ask. No player who is immersed in a game wants to pause and answer a 50 question multiple choice survey. Right? It, it, it breaks, the, we call it the golden circle, the magic circle of narrative. It breaks them out of that, right? So you gotta think about subtle ways to do that. Data collection and analysis plan is a big part of all of our, of our game work. And we, again, we get folks that that's what they do uh, is our decapping. Um, there is the danger. Some people say, oh, couldn't you record everything? Yeah, you can. Okay, there's plenty of technology to let us record every spoken word, everything that is said in the game, transcribe it, and then what? Okay, then it becomes a big analytics problem. And that now I've got a ton of data. And what am I going to do with it? How am I going to munch through it? So that's why the problem objective and what I didn't talk about, research questions are crucial. Okay because that's what we optimize the game for. We've got, uh, so my, my, once we start banging our heads against the wall with the sponsor, trying to understand why is your problem a problem, what's the objective, then my, anal my lead analyst for each game is gonna plow into that and start thinking, okay, literature review, what do we know about this subject? What seems to be the key questions that we need to try to get explored over the course of this game? The research questions then are what drive the techniques. Um, and this is why like in games, we loathe people just talking because it's, it's hard to capture in an effective way, okay? But if I make them use email, whoop, I got a digital record. Make them use chat, whoop, got a digital record. Every move sheet is a digital record because we use a digitized you know, in-house built computer system. Um, but much of what I'd say the challenge is uh, with terms of analytics, we call it, I had a game, now what? You've got to be have that in the front of your head. It can't be an afterthought. And so we've done certain things. If you, if you had the time, right, this is tough. If you have the time, you can do some fabulous stuff in plenary sessions, right? Plenary sessions are often, you know, players are tired, they wanna go home, um, they're done, they're just done, okay? They're exhausted. You, they, they usually exhaust about a day before your game ends, no matter how long your game is, all right? So, but the more you can get into like some of these real-time polling and analytic tools in plenary, a couple of advantages. One, they haven't got away from you. I did a game where in post-game analysis, I was looking at some of the data and I came up with this novel way to represent the data. And as I looked at it, I went, oh, wow, this is really interesting. I wish the players were still here so I could ask them about it. But they're long gone. They're scattered to the four corners. And if you think you're gonna reach back and get hold of your players, you know, three weeks after the game, good luck. Okay, trying to actually get something and have them remember and it, it, it's hard. So. We've got some tool sets that we like to use in plenary that immediately provide feedback. So, of course, again, I've got the luxury of having an auditorium that I can give everybody a computer in and, and have them enter data. Um, one of the tools we use is analytic hierarchy process, AHP. AHP has got its fans, it's got its detractors. Um, it's a multi-criteria decision aid, not decision maker. Um, some people want to use it as a decision maker, but it gives us the opportunity when players have been wrestling with problems and then they have got a choice to think about. So what command and control worked out better for you? Which preference did you have for A over B? Um, we have a, an in-house tool that allows them to use the AHP process, um, but immediately visualizes the results and throws them up on the big screen. I go, interesting. 70% of the senior officers in this room seem to think that this was an effective system while 98% of the junior officers are unhappy. Discuss. Right now. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. That's way more powerful there on the spot than it is 
three months later when the report comes out and buried in some annex is a bar graph that compares the two results. So the more you can do right now, right here with the players, um, this is sort of like we, we call it the, you know, as they, as they come off the pitch from playing soccer and they're still muddy and, and sweaty and you start engaging with them, you're going to get very different responses than if three months go by. That's good and bad, by the way. I had a senior officer, flag officer, two-star, who couldn't stop playing the game when we got to plenary. He was still pissed off. Right? He, was, he was upset that the game had gone the way it had and some submarine actions had gone badly for him. And he was still arguing about it. And we wanted to say, sir, the game is over. <sighs> Decompress. Let's talk about it. No. Games are meant to draw emotional engagement. And now I'm turning him, telling him to turn off his emotion when the game was designed to rile it up and now talk calmly about it. I should have known he couldn't do it. <laughs> Most of us can't. So yeah, we're still, we keep looking for tools. I mean, this is where probably we've had the most promise, quote unquote promise with AI type applications. Um, some people want to use AI different levels in gaming. This comes up all the time now. How are we going to incorporate AI in wargaming? Well, what do you mean? Okay. If you mean smarter autonomous weapons, that's a rule set. That's easy. That's boring. Okay. If you mean AI tools that are going to help commanders make decisions based on a bunch of uh, big data problems, problem with that is most AI tools need a lot of data to be fed into them. We realize that most games are already artificial information environments to start off with. I've already reduced the preponderance of information as part of my game design. So some people have actually proposed that we reintroduce a whole bunch of information just for the AI to crunch it down again. It's like, well, isn't that what I do? Isn't that my game's design? Is to simplify the data streams to present the most relevant pieces. So we have questions about, again, how that might work in a game. But crunching through the data at the back end of a game, ooh, there could be something there, there. So we've got some folks who are investigating different analytic uh, tools to do that. But right now, Analyst Notebook and those types of, uh, of uh, causal loop uh, software that helps to support causal loop analysis is what we're using primarily. That and a lot of survey uh, data that we collect from players as well. Um, again, another great topic. I got po folks who can talk to it far better than I can, and it might be a future discussion uh, we want to have. What else? What else? We've dwindled down to the hardy 12. One of the things I mentioned about that reality piece and, and how we can drive, how you can drive that home with people who want to fight the lack of reality is um, the example I use in the course and, and sometimes we'll use it in, in briefing players is moot court. Okay. My, again, my wife's an attorney. And so as part of her legal training, she had to argue before moot courts. And I, I got a picture of like the University of California's law school and it's a picture of some law students doing moot court. But what you notice, I, start, I say, so what is this? And everyone recognizes the courtroom. Okay, all right, but what's missing? And it takes me a bit to realize, oh, well, there's no jury. That's right, there's no jury. There's no defendant or plaintiff. That's right. Because think about what those people do in a courtroom environment. They sit there. The jury does not interact. They better not be, right? The jury sits there and listens. The plaintiff and the defendant typically sit there. They themselves do not speak or contribute to the course of their defense. They talk to their attorney, but they don't participate. There's no bailiff in the room, right? So if I wanted to make a real courtroom, I'd need to add, add a lot more to moot court, but to no end. Now, if on the other hand, the objective of today's moot court session is for the law students to be exposed to the potential of violence in the courtroom, a violent defendant, a disruptive gallery, and how the bailiffs and how security works inside of that courtroom. Now I need a defendant who's gonna be disrupted. Now I need a bailiff who is going to, you know, to interact with the audience. But that's because I need the, that, those bits of reality. I needed them because I had an objective that needed them. But most of the time, moot court is about them learning how to argue before a judge or a panel of judges. So that's what I need. I need a judge and a panel of judges. I don't, I don't need all those other parts. The same argument is made about war games. You only keep the bits you need. One of my old bosses used to say, a war game should be as complex as it needs to be and no more. And people are going to come and see your war game. And we talk about this under bad war games and, and how to deal with them. And it's called hanging another ornament on the Christmas tree. This is under the, the guise of getting more bang for your buck. Well, if you're going to do a war game, 
you might as well look at this too. It'll be more meaningful and we'll get more out of it. No, you won't. It's hard to make them understand this, but you won't. <laughs> right? And it's also part of what we call whiffing. What's in it for me? Right? You want, uh, good, we'll pick on SOPAC. You want that, you think that for the purposes of your game, you need them to participate because there's a role in the objective and in the operation for that type of capability. But it's a relatively narrow role. Now, SOPAC's looking at it going, wait, you want me to send a guy all the way from Hawaii for a week to be in your game, to do that? What's in it for me? A legitimate complaint, <laughs> okay? Because everyone's tight on you know, travel dollars and resources, et cetera. So having to feed this beast of somebody else's interests and trying to represent them in the game is one of the challenges the game designers have. And we usually lose this fight, okay? There'll be things that somebody wants jammed into your game after you've made that beautiful map and you've got it all, we, we liken it to a spider web. You have woven a delicate spider web of relationships and along comes somebody who's gonna help make your spider web better, okay? Have you ever touched a spider web and made it better, <laughs> right? You can't do it. So having created this elaborate interconnected world that delivers exactly what I need it to for the purposes of a gameplay, Somebody wants to jam something onto it. So we call it the bolt-on, right? And we also call these Franken games, where you have this keen sense that, hey, this game was working pretty well, except what's this awkward part over here that doesn't seem to work very well? Yeah, that was the part I was forced to jam in at the 11th hour to make some Air Force command happy. And it doesn't fit. And it's usually obvious to the players it doesn't fit. So trying to create, um, again, the, the reality argument in the sense that I only need this to be as real as I need it to be to get to the points I'm trying to understand. It has to be applicable to the real world. <laughs> we had an activity once where we wanted uh, senior officers to express their risk tolerance by putting jelly beans or beads in cups. They couldn't get it. Wait, I'm doing what? I'm putting beads in cups. This is stupid. I, humor me, sir. <laughs> Put the damn bead in the cup. <laughs> and after a while they go, oh, uh, Oh, we see what you're doing. Yeah, we're forcing you to make a concrete allocation of risk across the con and the cups are simply, ri yes. <laughs> right? But sometimes it's hard to get people who are expecting a simulation. They're expecting a command post exercise to understand that that's not what you're in. Uh, back to the, the miserable game in the fall that Danny referred to. Part of the problem with the game was this desire to replicate certain board centers and cells. The game had no need for board centers and cells to be done. We were trying to do, again, an abstract, you know, to get at other activities. We weren't going to make the players participate in the kind of briefing cycle that maybe but didn't support the game. And one of the biggest problems that we find is that senior officers are so used to getting a briefing that has taken hundreds of hours of manpower, right, to produce that they get to the game and they're like, where's my brief? I go, I don't know, where's your staff to make it? <laughs> because the game doesn't have that. The game is running on artificial time, not real time. You don't have a hundred staffers to crap out this PowerPoint brief, okay? You got five guys who, if you wanna make them work overnight, okay, but that's what you've got. And yet that's what they want because that's what they're used to seeing. On the one hand, you wanna lower the friction in the game by giving people things they're familiar with. It helps them push the I believe button. On the other hand, it's a game and I'm not simulating reality. I can't necessarily provide you the same sorts of resources that would produce the things you're expecting to see. It's a game. And getting them to understand that is really hard. Oh, by the way, anything I said I'd give you, if you don't remind Robert, you won't get it. <laughs> I'll forget. <laughs> I mean, if nobody's got one, I'll ask. So for those of us yeah. who are not working um, as much in the, the DOD space, the classified space, mm -hmm. where do you recommend we go to get practice on this stuff, right? I got a, war, I got a board game shelf that mirrors yours in a lot of ways. So I play the games and, and I'm into that. But I'd love to see it in a professional 
um, realm and really get a sense for how it works yeah. and what you know the reactions of participants are and things like that. So where do you get that if you're not in a DoD space? Yeah, if you're not in a DoD space, that's hard. Um, I mean, again, because my, my awareness is is either on the DoD side. Um, on the business side, the problem with business gaming is you think the DoD wants to be classified. You ought to see how proprietary business gaming gets. <laughs> Right. And so those things are uber closed uh, and very quiet. And you, you'll, you'll never remember that. One game we ran um, many years ago uh, for a large tech company in the Northwest that shall go unnamed. Um, they were freaking out when the, the, uh, they booked a hotel a conference center for us to run our business war games in. And the, the hotel people, their event managers or whatever, had these little digital marquees outside of the rooms and put up the name of the company and that they were doing a business war game, like, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday kind of thing. And they lost their freaking minds. <laughs> so those are super quiet. Um, yeah. So where to go to look um, the here, uh, some of the places that actually it, uh, Tufts university runs um, uh, what do they call it? The uh, Simulex. Uh, and it's for a bit kind of a poli sci environment. Uh, for the poli side side of the house. And actually, it's a very well run, running time game that they're often looking for people to help with, uh, typically in their in their running time adjudication cell type stuff. Um, so that's one I know of that's out there. Um, Simulex at uh, at Tufts um, is going to be a little more accessible uh, than some of the other environments. Um, I tell people you can make a game out of anything. I mean, yeah, my my my, my professional life is is military war game, um, but again, I I spend a fair amount of, no, not a fair amount of time. I, I've got a hobby side that I've worked with, again, companies like Hasbro and Haywire Games and that type of thing, um, and some of their stuff. And uh, there's a huge amount of overlap, intellectual overlap in the design approach. Uh, so that's why I tell people, play board games. Well, what's that have to do with it? Well, play board games. <laughs> Those things came about using the same intellectual brain power that produces a, a military war game. Um, yeah, the college's games are next to impossible because of the classification they get involved with. Um, and even our unclass games then tend to be very focused on student activities, so it's limited to them. So I don't have a great, oh, but I tell you where you should go. The Connections Conferences. Yeah, Robert's told us about it, yeah. Yeah, 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 do connect. Now again, this year, okay, COVID-19, so it's, it's, it's knocking the crap out of them. Um, but uh, the U.S. Connections will be hosted by CNA in a, in a massive Zoom session this year. Uh, the Brits are waffling around I don't think they've, I, eh, I you know, donuts, they're going to go virtual too uh, this year. Um, but if you can get to either the U.S. or the U.K., um, the, uh, there's like one in Canada uh, that's done in, uh, by McGill University uh, in uh, at Toronto or Montreal, I forget which. But they tell it, they do it in February. It's like, oh, Canada in February, y'all. Sign me up. Okay. Um, so usually less enthusiastic on that one. Uh, even in the U.S., I mean, the one year it was a choice of going to Montgomery, Alabama uh, at Maxwell Air Force Base was the site for the U.S. Connections Conference in August, or uh, I could delay until the fall and go to London. Hmm, London in the fall, Montgomery in the summer. <laughs> I went to London that year. Um, but the Connections Conferences are excellent um, because you get the breadth of us, okay? You get the hobby gamers, you get the high-end um, professional military gamers. Um, the, my, uh, my colleague Gore from the, he shows up at connections, for example. Um, so yeah, that's probably the one of the biggest things is, is the hawk, is the uh, connections and where there are. Like, again, they they occur in Canada, the United States, the UK. There's usually one in Europe. Uh, the Dutch usually host one, fairly small though, and then the Australians host one, and it just kind of revolves around the globe throughout the course of the year. So I guess one more quick question for me. Yep. I was at indo a few months ago. I was meeting with their J3 folks and I was like, hey, uh, you know, you guys have DODD 3000.05. You know, we have our stabilization advisor going out there to work in their J5 starting next month. Uh, just curious what kind of gaming or exercises you're doing on phase four. And they looked at me like I was crazy, which, you know, okay, I got it. Uh, they said, how about you talk yeah. to T at the War Fighting Center, or talk to T. I said, hey, you know, and I linked him up with Robert. Uh, Robert. Uh, we haven't really progressed that much, but we got our, our guy going out there in a month. But have you seen any gaming from your end on phase four? No, because okay. everyone thinks phase four is boring. <laughs> and the problem is that from a, from a, a holistic 
perspective, um, the military knows intellectually that how we leave you in phase three, the, you know, how we win the, the war will influence how we quote unquote win or don't win the peace that follows. And most military gaming does have this all in mentality that it's a scorched earth. It doesn't matter what it takes to win. That's what you do. And then you let the pieces fall where they may to state the cleanup in phase four. Uh, unfortunately, it's a prevalent attitude. Uh, so unless the game is about that, you typically don't see much of it. Um, and that's why I, I emphasize, like I just got off a call with the, the NATO uh, Medical Center of Excellence and they were complaining about, about medical gaming. I says, you've got to make your case that you want a game about you, right? So uh, one of the other areas I did some gaming in, not quite phase four, but similar in terms of uh, uh, natural disaster work where everybody who wants to game in the United States, defense res or a disaster response, either man-made disasters, you know, dirty bomb, terrorist event, or natural disasters, hurricanes, um, is always very excited about the initial incident and the response. And they're really not interested in recovery. And in some cases, recovery is way harder to think about than it is initial response. We did some dirty bomb ex uh, work uh, with uh, King County, uh, Seattle, uh, uh, Washington State. And we, it was all, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You had an event, got it. Okay, it was an anthrax episode, got it. But now what? You've got six city blocks in downtown Seattle that have been contaminated. We're, we're, we're past that we caught the bad guys, we got the people, but now what? It's a huge economic conundrum. EPA doesn't know what to do. Local authorities don't know what to do. It becomes a black hole in the heart of a city because no one wants to think through the ramifications of the after the bang. Yeah, 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 we all, again, everyone likes to run to the sound of gunfire. That's fun from a gaming perspective, right? But it's the sloppy aftermath that, that no one wants to really deal with because it doesn't seem like there's much fun to play. So unless you specifically want games about phase four and reconstruction and et cetera, you don't get them. That's just the, again, it's, it's simply not where your Indo-PACOM commander's head is. And that's the biggest problem. And again, that's, that's what a lot of the communities find that the people who tend to sponsor the games, they get the most pull are your four-star geographic combatant commanders. If you're going to get them to be the sponsor and get them, you know, and get the CNO to allocate them bandwidth at the war college to get it one of our eight, uh, games a year that are about that scale, you got to convince them that it's important. And unless you put it in terms of how does it impact you and how does it make your life harder or easier? Eh, eh. I mean, remember, these are people who have a hard time figuring out how they're going to do phase one, two, three. <laughs> and here you are trooping in there talking about phase four. Well, get in the back of the room. That's the problem. I have a question. I am wondering in this COVID world, how have you been thinking about running a war game? in a pandemic situation, particularly for people from state that don't have the same resources, don't have the same infrastructure that you do. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So, <laughs> distributed gaming. This has become a huge topic of late. <laughs> I wonder why. All right. And um, so we did a little bit of an internal study and it's ongoing for the college uh, because we're thinking about uh, but right now, there's no gaming going on at the college. Right? You can imagine the college is shut down. We, you know, we're all hanging out at home. And because of the nature of the classification, it makes distribution hard. Uh, but we've been thinking about distribution. And when people say distribution, that's the first thing that we discovered is that we're not all talking the same language. So we actually broke down the consideration of doing distributed gaming into a couple of aspects. One of them is the geographic distribution. Okay? Um, the degree to which players are distributed. Are we talking about people sitting by themselves in front of their laptop, wherever they are, be home, office, but that's, that, that's as, as isolated as we can get to the other end of the spectrum is we're all together, right? We're all together hanging out in a cruddy little hall at the war college. And there's a whole spectrum in between. So there's the geographic separation part of the conversation. There's the time part of this discussion. Some people just assume that when we said distributed gaming, we still meant that we'd all be online at the same time. You go, well, that's nice, unless you're, I got players in indo Paycom and I got all players in UCOM. Uh, maybe not, <laughs> okay? So this sense of distribution in time and asynchronous, asynchronous versus synchronous gameplay 
is an issue. Uh, and are we expecting players such that, and we've run games like this more for students where it's, Hey, I don't care how you do it, but by Thursday, submit a move. You know, here's the moves, here's the forms. I don't care what you do, but on Thursday, I need to see that you've emailed them to the control team, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, problems obviously with multiple or uh, with multi-cell games where this is supposed to re represent le levels of command. And if the JIFMIC players are in Hawaii, but the task force commander is physically located in Germany, well then how are they gonna, what are they gonna do? Real time? No, no, I don't think, you, who's gonna be, no. <laughs> well then how are you gonna do it? So that's a good, so geographic separation and ge geographic distribution, time distribution, classification. Within at least DOD, we do have networks. Okay, that we can play over different classification levels. It's the, okay, that's nice, but while a fair number of folks are gonna have access to say SIPR, far fewer are gonna have access to JWIX, and way fewer are gonna have access above that. So suddenly now it's not a matter of who do I need to play? It's like, well, who can physically play? Who's got a SCIF that has more than one computer connected to that network, All right? That's gonna be a problem. So the classification of how it now impacts the ability to access the distribution system is a problem with, or is something we had to wrestle with in uh, distributed gaming. Um, and I said we had a fourth factor, which is escaping me at the moment, since I'm the one who wrote this paper. I think I remember. Um, but so we are looking at this right now. Um, oh, I noticed it was the nature of the um, tools that are available. With the War College, you know, we've got bespoke wargaming software that I have in-house software engineers build, okay? But as soon as I start moving, and, and that works inside of the closed enclave that is the War College's networks. We are, we've got isolated networks, four of them, um, at different classification levels. And that all works because they are isolated. But as soon as I wanna use something like uh, the uh, SDRAN, the, uh, the uh, research uh, network, or other classified networks, well, what tools do I have I can put on there? We were told that we could not our wargaming tool on SIPR, for example, without going through a whole lot of certification processes that we don't have to pay attention to when we're just doing it in-house. So what tool sets are we using? Um, I, there's a game that's being run for the Center for New American uh, Studies here uh, in two weeks or in a week's time. And they're basically co-oping PowerPoint, Excel, and email, <laughs> okay, to be able to run their games. So geographic distribution, time distribution, classification and tools. No one quote distributed game looks at all of those factors the same. So we're, we're monkeying around with this, the thinking about it. My, my boss does not want to think about it because it gets hard <laughs> and it's more resources and whatnot. But if we look at a, at a second wave of COVID in the fall, um, we really, the college is going to be forced to really start thinking about, okay, we used to do this in the eighties and nineties. The War College did massive thousand player distributed games. It's all part of the Cold War uh, period. We stopped doing that around the turn of the century. Um, and we've done much more, you know, inside of the lifelines of McCarty Little uh, since then. Um, but we're seeing the demand signal start thinking about this distributed piece again. Uh, we've been looking at COTS games to see if they are suitable for uh, online play. Command, uh, formerly known as Command Naval Air, Command, command, Modern Air and Naval Operations. I'm now just shortened to command, and there is a command professional edition, which allows you to manipulate the database and maybe put in some classified information. We've been playing with those. The biggest problem we found with most COTS stuff right now is that industry, the people they sell to, want to play tactical games, right? That you want, you want to play, you, I, want to, I want to drive the plane, right? And I want to be, shoot, I want to put that guy in the pipper and shoot him down. I don't want to be a guy going, click. Enable air launch, click. I need a menu. Launch two fighters, click. Watch them fuck, <laughs> right? But that's kind of what we want <laughs> at the operational level of war, right? So there's not a lot of tools out there that want to play at that level. Command actually markets itself as an operational level game. And we discovered that, no, you use operational level symbology for them to fight tactically. <laughs> So we're still struggling to see if there's a software out there, but we also tell people that and they're always surprised when they come to the college, um, and if, especially our foreign, our, our allies and partners, and they think that we've got in the basement some really cool computer that must be the bee's knees when it comes to war gaming. 
It must be awesome. No, we don't. <laughs> right? I've got a glory. My, my, uh, my wargaming tool, which we're trying to come up with a name with because we're tired of calling it the tool, uh, really is simply an information collector, distributor, and display. That's all it does. It collects player move sheets, which could quite frankly be a PowerPoint slide they fill out. And yeah, we have a digitized version, but it's really just a move sheet, okay? That transmits that move sheet and goes into a workflow. And you can imagine with our big games, an awful lot of worksheets get generated, so to speak. So we need a way to sort, bin, filter. And that's what it does. But in the end, it's just humans. They have to sit there and stare at the screen and decide whether the submarine got sunk or not, and then push that information back out again. And that kind of game, that kind of play by mail game, you can play with Microsoft Office. Okay? I had a colleague put together a game for King's College of London, and the entire game was built on Gmail. Okay? The player, he created player Gmail accounts. The G drive became the shared drive for the, you know, the information. The players simply emailed and shared Microsoft Office documents that were game templates back and forth over that type of structure. What the, that gave them the ability to do was to make a game that did not rely on the local networks for connectivity. Because you're just using the internet. You know, you're using basic email or whatever. Um, and it worked brilliantly. So you can co-opt stuff to effectively get a distributed type of game, but you've got to be sensitive to all those issues. And, then, and back to some of the early questions about analysis, you got to understand what you're giving up in analysis. And I understand what you're giving up in player experience when you do that. Um, you won't know what's going on at the distant end in a cell unless you put a trusted agent out there to help. I mean, it's one of the issues that we have, right, is that you get these complex games and the players all look at each other going, wait, what do I do? Or they start doing it and they're doing it too slow. Um, and they're, facilitation, moderation, all of that gets lost in most distributed game scenarios. But we are seriously looking at it. Um, because again, um, and we said, yes, COVID-19 has forced our hand, but this is probably something that, that we should have been looking at some time ago. Because increasingly, we do have commands that complain about the distance, the time, commitments, et cetera. Um, we've got commands that want us to come to them. We dislike that. Um, because the lie they'll say, they'll tell themselves the same lie. They say, oh, if you come here, you'll get far more access to the commander. And we'll have, you know, more people can participate. No, they can't. Mm -hmm. They're, they're still right there at their desks, right? When the commander decides that he's got something more important to do, he will walk out of your game, right? When the opso says, oh, I'll just be, I got 20 minutes, I got to go do this thing, and he doesn't show up for a day and a half later. So when you get him in McCarty Little Hall at the War College, they're trapped. You're TAD and you're trapped, right? So I have your full attention. So, I mean, again, pros and cons, playing full away, playing at home, playing distributed, but we are looking at distribution now more seriously than we have in the past. We're not I have another question, unless somebody else would like to go. Yeah, no. yeah um, pile on, Amy. So I'd also like to hear about running a small game, because again, mm -hmm. coming from the State Department point yeah. of view, we're not talking about hundreds of participants in terms, at least that's what I'm assuming. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we have, yeah. About, <laughs> no, reach like, out, go big. <laughs> and, and so, First of all, you know, are you running small games where you are? And secondly, kind of, are there um, particular recommendations or insights that you have gleaned about things that work well with running a small game and things that don't work well with running a smaller game? Yep. We do run small games. Um, they're not one of the big eights. So our, our quote, big eight are these massive games that we're running for the, the combatant commanders, basically, and the CNO. Um, but in between those games, we do do some more, you know, smaller, more bespoke events, especially at the really high classification levels because there's not that many people that have access to that kind of data. So a couple of things about small games. Um, you got to be careful you don't overtask your players because you don't have many of them. Right? So there's a workload distribution problem. Um, it's not unusual that players will, t people coming from a big game background, with the expectation that in an hour and a half, the blue cell should be able to do X. Yeah, well, it's a tiny fraction of X when the blue cell is two people, okay? Um, the other thing that we, that we typically see in small games is where small games, the small game format, uh, where it's the, this is the matrix gaming format. Um, and matrix gaming uh, done well is very powerful. It's low overhead, um, perfect for small groups, 
wonderful for, for soft power problems. But as I said before, you need a skilled facilitator. The best book to pick up, and it's in my office, not here at home. Um, the best book to pick up is a matrix. It's called uh, Innovations in Wargaming, Matrix Gaming. And Matrix Gaming Innovations. It's by John Curry. Um, and, 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 and John Curry, and I'll come to Tim, 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 oh, what else? Tim's, Tim's name. John Curry and Tim, I'll think of it. I'll, I'll let you know before we get off. Um, but uh, Innovations in Wargaming, Matrix Gaming, uh, and that book, uh, and I've got a, a supplemental book. Uh, oh, Tim Price. Uh, I have a supplemental book by the authors. Um, Tim Price is actually a pseudonym for a, a US, or I'm sorry, a British uh, army officer who has been doing Matrix games for 20 years. Um, he is amazing at Matrix games. And the problem with Tom is he makes it look so easy. You watch Tom run a Matrix game, you go, wow, that's just like, he's just like talking and people are doing stuff and we could do that until you try to fill Tom's shoes and you realize, oh my God, this is not easy at all. <laughs> so the, and that's where we find the small games. So small games are great for tabletop environments. Um, they're low, typically low overhead. Um, you may separate players, um, maybe just the adversarial players, red and blue, uh, just to prevent that whole that whole dynamic. Uh, if you want to play with the information sets between them, um, but the the danger again is the workload. And small groups, especially the more senior they get, the less they want to work. Okay, so you get senior folks that quote quote unquote senior folks that come into play. And if they have to do more than talk about what they would do and tell you a decision, you say, that's brilliant. Could you fill out the move sheet? They'll look around for somebody junior to do that part. All right. So there, there's a certain expectation from senior folks of what you say you're going to do a game and what they're going to actually do um, and what that means and then how much support you have to provide to go along with that. The higher up you play, because usually small games tend to be higher, or they tend to be at the, just at the ends. Okay, they either to be very high level games or very low level games, um, which does in some ways help you deal with your white cell problem. Because when you're at the bottom, you're at the bottom. There's only people above you. So you don't have to represent a whole lot above the players. And it's relatively easy to do. Likewise, when you're at the top of the pyramid, there's not a whole lot immediately below uh, the highest levels. Now, it fans out as you go, but you don't have to represent all that. Or you don't have to have people playing all that. You can simply represent that simply uh, with a map. One of the things that we found is really effective um, for strategic level small group games are the are the the cartoon maps. Go PowerPoint. Okay. What we found is that when we started using stuff like Google Earth, suddenly everyone got intensely interested in how many buildings are on the left side of the road intersection in Gdansk because they can, <laughs> right? And they will drill down. And after they try to find their own house, they'll drill down in your game space, right? And trying to find some incredibly nuanced piece of information. You go, why do you care? All right? I can't imagine the president like zooming in at this level, right? But when you give them a PowerPoint map with great big blobby tokens that say Sixth Fleet on them, they accept it. It's amazing how their brains click over. When they see the cartoon, they accept a high degree of abstraction and roll up that even though you could keep Google Earth you know, zoomed out, but because it offers more detail, they go looking for more detail. When the game clearly offers no more detail than what they have, they play with what they got. Nobody drills in on a risk board. <laughs> you can't, right? Same thing. We've argued that our geopolitical game, once upon a time we used to play only on PowerPoint slides, worked fine. Then we decided to get sexy and start using digital maps. Oh. We started, again, looking for the intersection and get answered. So small groups still need facilitation. Don't, don't think that you can't hold these people's hand, okay? So you still need effective facilitation. Don't overburden them with a lot of things to do, okay? You're better off asking players to make a few decisions in a short period of time, but then make lots of them then you are giving them a ton of time, well, you, well, you think it's a ton of time, to make a bunch of decisions. So you're far better off engaging. What would you do at this point? What's your decision with, with regard to you know, activating the reserve or 
um, contacting the uh, the embassy, having the embassy make a you know, make a call on the little little things. Matter of fact, matrix gaming only lets you do one thing a turn. That's it. That's all you're allowed to do, and that forces players to think, what's the most important thing I need to get done this? If I'm only going to get one thing to do, so that keeps it very tight, makes it easy for them. You only get to pick one thing. But we're going to have to ask you in 20 minutes to make another pick and another pick and another choice, another choice. That's far more digestible by small groups than it is the big games where you say you have three hours to turn in a maritime plan, an airstrike plan, a, uh, an engagement plan, uh, a, a, a special operation. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If you got 50 people in the cell, maybe they can do it, but you're not going to get 50 people in the cell. You're going to get a couple of twosy, threesies. So you've got to make sure you match. Remember my decision maps. What are the decisions? Who makes those kinds of decisions? We keep them paired. Okay? You can go up and down a little bit. All right. Obviously, you can have a, 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 someone from the government play the president okay? that's been in, involved in senior levels of the U.S. government. They could probably credibly play a president. Okay? Can you bring in some lieutenant commander attache that happens to be attached right now and have him play the president? No. You could, but why? <laughs> All right. You're not going to get much out of him. So think about what it is you're asking them to make decisions about. Try to keep that ask set really small uh, and give them rapid feedback on those decisions. This is another curse of small group gaming is it tends to turn into bog sats. Sorry, it turns into what? I didn't catch A bog sat. Okay. B-O-G-S-A-T. Bunch of guys and gals sitting around a table. Okay. All right, that's all they do. They sit around the table and they talk. And they never make a decision because you'll you just let them know, what would you think about? Well, we think about the implications for uh, stability on the Albanian. What would you do though? Well, we'd have to think about that. And we would consider, yeah, but what are you gonna do this turn? Well, we're, we would debate many different things. Make a freaking decision. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Right? And they don't wanna. If you let them, they'll talk about the problem but they'll make no decisions. This is the problem, um, and, and we talked about the, the pandemic brief that I give, and it's about, it's about 45 minutes or so. Um, but part of the problem with the first iteration of that game in 2016 was the participants didn't have to make a decision. They could brainstorm ideas. What might you do about quarantining? What might you do about uh, movement restrictions? Um, what might you do? But they didn't actually have to do it. And I found that very, I mean, the, the, the people who participated thought it was great and they got a lot out of it. Okay, wonderful. But as a gamer, you're always critiquing, okay? And I'm looking at that game going, eh, eh it's all right, all right? And I said, boy, if I ever have to do this one again, I'd like to make some changes. Sure enough, fast forward four years, we got asked in the fall of 2019 to do a do-over. And I went, oh my God, it's a do-over. Here's what I want to do. And I spent November, December building an Excel-based, rather elaborate, Excel-based model for modeling um, the spread of a pandemic in the United States using all the factors I briefed today. And now they had to pick, make a choice, decide, open or close the schools, choose. Open or close LAX, choose. I mean, we gave them a little more granularity than that, but, um, but that was the idea. So don't let small groups get away with becoming discussion sessions. Compel them to make a decision and then give them feedback. No one likes to make decisions and not get feedback. Now, how you give the feedback goes back to the facilitation techniques, okay, and the credibility of your facilitators, right? Um, you can never structure, so the more senior they are, the more prickly they tend to be, right? And so you can't structure feedback in a way that seems to indicate that they were wrong, <laughs> right? Or they did something bad. They're being punished because they were stupid. Hey, it doesn't help, right? So you always have to think about how you're going to structure that feedback. And one of the ways in matrix gaming you get around that is you don't actually decide. All the other players collectively decide what the likely outcomes of that would be. If you did that, how likely do you, or I should say, if you want to do that, how likely is it that you'd think that you would get the effect you want? And you start asking other, other players. And other players say, well, I'm a little confused. I don't see how you could do that in a time." Um, 
I'm I'm not sure that the, the that my government will respond in that way. If you get someone playing on the you know, opposing side, uh, and ultimately you kind of boil it down into this gross sense of um, we call the, the the five points: very likely, likely, equally likely as not, unlikely, very unlikely, and you roll a die. It's surprising how they'll accept that after hearing the conversation as to why the collective seems to think that an action is only likely versus very likely to happen, and you cast the die, there's been to be very little bitching. You go behind closed doors and come out and say, yeah, it didn't work. No, oh, they'll bitch to high. <laughs> so I, again, for small groups, I highly recommend matrix gaming, but I always caveat it with, you, you, you need some internal practice. Yeah, again, I'm happy to give the, 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 uh, the talk on how to do matrix gaming um, and push some resources along matrix gaming. Everyone's very is liquored up on matrix gaming. It's been around for a long, long time. It used to be, it's a party game, right? And if you ever did a dinner party where the host suddenly stands up and announces, ladies and gentlemen, there's been a murder, right? And they start passing out envelopes, right? Yeah, you're essentially doing a matrix game. And people then can forward arguments about how well, clearly it was Judy. Judy killed him. Why? Because um, I'm going to make up a reason real quick. Because Judy was having an affair. I took one of those games once, and I, I reper it was a commercially available one. And uh, I did not have four men and four women. I had three and five. So I thought I looked at the roles closely enough. Um, and one was a Russian princess, Tsarina. And I made it a czar because that's what I had, five and three. I did not realize that around about the, the fifth move, she announces she's pregnant, <laughs> which made the game rather interesting at that point. <laughs> Thank you. That, that, that's really helpful. I appreciate your insight. <laughs> okay. Right. We're down to a hearty five or so. And one of them is me again. It's just that's a stunt me down here. I'll put my hand up for a presentation on Matrix games at some point, if that's an option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a relatively short one. Um, uh, in terms of just hitting the, we're really just trying to explain what does this mean, uh, matrix gaming and, and the resources around it. At the college, then, as part of the course, then we play. Um, we've got a Falklands, uh, uh, Falklands conflict that we play um, just again, so you can see the mechanic and work. Um, uh, but again, that's a little bit more difficult to do in a Zoom environment. Uh, but I can certainly talk about, again, just the basic uh, structures behind mechanics. How do you design a matrix game? How do you put one together? There's right ways and wrong ways to do it, um, et cetera. So yeah, again, it's something we can coordinate. Rob, do you want to come up with a time to do a matrix game um, or a brief on it? We can, we can certainly entertain that. The games are cool. I'll talk about games all day. You know, I just want to say thank you. Unfortunately, I have to run to another meeting. But I promise that I'll watch the rest of the recording for all the other great questions. <laughs> and um, thank you again, Robert. And thank you, Pete. And yes, for certainly. Thanks for coming too. Yep. So, yeah, if anybody else needs to pitch out. I actually do have another question. But again, I want yep. to leave it. Do either one of you have anything? So th this is a very open-ended question because I don't know enough about this to know what language to use. So maybe you can help me figure out how to articulate this. Yeah. It, you know, most of, I, I was reading the materials beforehand and most of the things that this is really about um, military wargaming. And so what I'm wondering is how does it change and how does it differ when diplomacy is your primary goal and your, prob yeah. your, your, your problem statement is about what diplomatic moves do I need to make or can I make or should I make? Could you speak to a little bit yeah. about that? So our degree game is exactly that. And degree is deterrence, escalation, what's the G for? Degree something. Degree, deterrence, escalation. It's a political game. All right, so I can't go to the text part. Uh, but usually, and, it, and, it, and part of it is it revolves uh, uh, nuclear armed competitors, right? Because that's always the shadow, right, in the, in the background. And in many games, we tend to minimize the thought that, you know, we, we are going, we're going at hammer and tongs in a conventional sense with someone who does have tactical or at least strategic nuclear weapons. Why is that not a consideration? Focus, et cetera. Degree, it is the focus. 
and it is a focus at the diplomatic level. So one of the nuances that we discovered that we had to provide for diplomacy games was the sense of real-time communications. Most of the games, remember I talked earlier about this idea about move step, how the clock doesn't move, and then it jumps ahead by four hours or jumps ahead by three days uh, type of thing. For diplomacy, that doesn't work well. And we had this constant tension between people trying to communicate in real time uh, and you know, have a summit or let's get together and have a meeting. Let's, let's, let's communicate um, about what's unfolding and the military part of the game that just wants to run ahead and move step and jump ahead quickly. Uh, and so what we've done with degree is in those games, we have two distinct periods. The first half of the game is running time, where it is real-time communications between the parties over a chat system. Okay, that way we get it all recorded. So it all has to be chat. And in that time period, they are free to negotiate and, and do whatever, whatever diplomacy calls for in terms of talking. Diplomatic things like demarches uh, and other actions that would be in state's toolkit tend to then be things may talk about during the running time portion of the game. And if you decide to carry those things out, embargo, sanctions, etc., then in the move step part of the game, those are now applied. Now, what's, what's fun about degree is talk is cheap. People will tell each other whatever they want to hear in the running time part of the game. Why certainly, Ambassador, we will consider and we find this to be a unique opportunity to to, to stabilize our relationships. And are we done? Okay, I want to move a military force onto the border. <laughs> it happens all the time. And then the first thing the players have to get around their heads around is that when things don't unfold in degree the way you thought they should unfold, it is not because control is screwing with you. It is always another player. So we had one game where uh, one of the blue team was convinced that uh, a bunch of social media hacking that was going on was control, just trying to stir things up. Oh my God, no, it was the North Koreans. <laughs> That's what they were doing. That was, their, you know, that was their part of the play. And it was, what was unfortunate was because the blue team thought that that was some sort of inject, they ignored it had they realized that, no, no, you were being screwed with by another player, you might not have continued to be so conciliatory in your other discussions that followed, had you known that they were the actor. Um, and you could have found out if you'd bothered to pull the string a little bit. Um, but again, they just assumed it was, it was me uh, screwing with them. So diplomacy games must put a premium, we found, on real-time talking because it gets otherwise very disconnected in players' heads about how, how can we do ongoing negotiations when the clock just jumped ahead 72 hours? And that messes with them. So we don't do it that way. We have a period where we say it's, it's basically, it's now, it's, you know, whatever, it's Tuesday. Um, and you are, here's the situation in front of you. Here are your communications channels. You have an open channel to talk to the Russians, the view, whoever, you were, you know, wherever the adversaries are. And usually these are multi-sided games. Right? We seldom ever do this one-on-one, -on -one, okay? Because it just doesn't, that's not the world of the way the world unfolds. There's always at least a NATO problem to complicate things. There's an EU aspect to it. There's an ASEAN aspect to it. There's a Japan if we're in the you know, Pacific and it's really about us and China. Yeah, it's never really about us. There's other people who have vested interests. So these are always multi-cell games. But we keep the cells, again, try to keep them tight. I mean, you need someone representing heads, a head of state. You probably need someone then representing, you know, outside of the head of state, then the big pieces of government, you know, in terms of a military guy, not a hundred military guys. You just need someone that represents your, your head of the military mission. Um, and then you need maybe a, your state line, your diplomatic line. And then perhaps you also want to have a finance piece to this thing, because if you think that sanctioning is going to be part of this and economic boycotting and whatnot, maybe that's going to be ex executed through a treasury branch or something like that. Um, but you can keep this relatively cabinet-esque, okay, in terms of the number of players but you gotta let them talk to each other in real time. Then have a period of time for those things that you can't do in real time. We're not gonna spend the time in the game watching the carrier sail at 27 knots 
out of Norfolk, go all the way across. We, 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 we got to fast forward this, all right? Because right? everyone's going to get bored, right? So we're going to, so parts of it, you will jump, okay? But we sometimes we do, we only do the minimum jump necessary to get to the next friction point. And this is a part where that it takes a little bit of a, you know, a nuanced game team to realize that you can either set all your move steps ahead of time. So in degree, um, we usually tell the players, okay, you, you got your real time, you're from now until lunch, you can talk away, come up with agreements and uh, agreements and treaties and you knock yourselves out. At noon, we're gonna cut off that channel. We have to, because otherwise they'll keep talking and not pay attention to the stuff we need for the adjudication portion of anything like embargoes and military movement and positioning of forces to hold something at risk, et cetera. So at that point, then we require them to now commit to paper actions. And they can be diplomatic, you know, they can be demarches, they can be, you know, whatever. And the other part we also tell them to do is put in the conditionals. Because this is where they all, players often get in, in diplomatic games, they get a little irritated that they didn't get a chance to respond to an action. You know, the game like played past the decision point, which is kind of a party foul on the part of, of war gaming. So in order not to have the game have to come to, you know, every time we start to adjudicate, we go, oh, you know, we're going to get 20 minutes into the adjudication. We're going to have to stop and go back to the players. We ask, we said, look, put in conditionals. Because let's, let's remember, if you really think that you're going to be able to react quickly to an incident which is occurring on the Eastern European border from Washington, yes, I get the thousand mile screwdriver, et cetera, but there are, there are going to be delays and making anything happen. It's fog and friction, okay? So if you actually want something to happen quickly, you would have it in real life. You got to use the real life argument. You would have had to have already let people know these are the conditions under which you already have authority to do things. Um, because we're not gonna wait to go find the president on a golf course to find out if he's gonna authorize the use of, of force in space or something. So that's part of a move in a diplomatic game is to put in the conditionals. And now the adjudication team decides, okay, you know what? Out of this next, the next week looks boring, you know, in game time. And because based on what they've put in, they're just moving forces around. And there's nothing very interesting. All right, let's, let's let it play out for seven days. And we'll come back and tell the players that seven days have gone by and here's the world. On the other hand, you sit there and go, oh my God, one day in, the Russians have moved a massive force under the guise of an exercise onto the border with Belarus. This is going to freak out every, every one of the Baltic states. We should probably stop at this point and report that major force movement back to the players and let them resume from there. So now the time scales becomes variable. It just is just based on events. If there's nothing interesting, go to the end of the planning window you told the players to anticipate for. If something catastrophic happens 24 hours in, stop the clock. And say this is where we are and let them react. Uh, so that, that's usually what we find in diplomatic games is we've got to be able to give them that both that flexibility of, A, they need running time to talk, to be able to negotiate in real time. But then at some point, they do have to commit to actions. But those actions do not lock, don't tie their hands for the next three, seven, nine, 20 days. It depends. And in which case, we turn it back over to them to let them continue. So it's worked out really well with our degree game. And just in terms of follow-up, it sounds like in that case, the facilitator is also incredibly important if you're really responding to them in a very kind of real-time fashion as well. Yeah. Now, and what we do with degree is at most degree is a two move a day game. Okay. Um, and we, it's, it's the infamous lunch and end of day, all right? Those are natural breaks. So it's easy to have players, you know, do the, give them um, an hour or so, three hour, two, three hours in the morning to do the diplomacy bits and then coordinate and talk amongst themselves. And, and the Japanese are talking to the Americans who aren't talking to the Chinese, la, 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 la. and then have a period of time where they now they have to commit all that talk to paper, commit to it. You said you're going to give them basing rights. Did you really? Or you just, you know, you just stringing them along, do all that. And then turn all that stuff in at noon now, or 1130. Now go away. Lunch go, you know, just go away because we're going to spend the next two hours adjudicating this. And now the players aren't, you know, sitting around waiting, they're eating, they're socializing, they're whatever. And they come back in, but when they come back in at 1330, they're expecting to see an updated, you know, updated map and up, updated situation to get a briefing and then they go again. At the end of the day, then um, we say the problem with the night move is the lunch move compels adjudication to get it done in two hours. Mm -hmm. It's coming back. The night move, eh, you get no pressure other than the fact that you don't want to stay up all night. Yeah, but apparently some people do. 
And the night adjudication will drag on for all hours. But that's when we do it. That way, the players aren't waiting for responses. They have something else to do, which is lunch and end of day. But that means you only get two moves a day. And that's now we're back into, okay, but I can keep people at the college for a week. If you can only keep them on site or involved for a couple of hours, then you don't want to have necessarily an adjudication methodology that requires a closed adjudication session. And now you can, we can start getting into conversations. That's, that's my another brief of, oh my God, they're rolling dice, uh, how to do adjudication. There are ways to do adjudication faster. Um, do it with the players as part of the activity. Um, but again, it's back to game design objectives, what you're trying to get done, how quickly you're trying to do it, et cetera, um, that looks at some of these quick turn cycles uh, to try to get that type of stuff done. But um, it, it's all very doable. Um, and of course, from you know, my perspective, since I've been doing it for 16 plus years, it always seems obvious, come on, how hard can this be? <laughs> I get it, because 16 years ago, I was clueless. Um, it's just been a lot of on the job training. But steal from games like, Diplomacy games, oh, especially. Steal from uh, Secret Hitler. Anybody? Anybody? Secret Hitler? No. 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 Oh. <laughs> You've got to go get Secret Hitler. All right. Yep. Now, the problem with Secret Hitler is it's not a COVID-19 friendly game. Um, because you need a bunch of friends. <laughs> um, and you could play it on Tabletop Simulator. Yeah. That's <laughs> have, like so, Secret Hitler. Secret Hitler. Um, Secret Hitler is, a, is one of the social deduction games. And um, for your world, um, there are several secret deduction, or I should say social deduction games that um, if you play them, you can start thinking about we use some of these mechanics ups and downs um every card game is an abstract game because we don't deal cards in real life but in card games that's what you have everything is expressed by a card right an action or whatever you can do is typically expressed by a card some people can make the mental shift the card is simply a representation it's a, it's a nice tangible way to represent an action other people go cards what are we using cards for this is stupid um, but games like Secret Hitler, Dead Last. Oh, we played Dead Last, Robert. That was that assassination game. Uh, Dead Last, uh, Secret Hitler, um, Code Names. Yeah. Right? Good old Code Names. These are games that rely on some type of, and then the game Diplomacy, kind of the classic Diplomacy game is Diplomacy. Um, games that rely on either explicit and, uh, and very uh, overt communications between players or games like Secret Hitler and Dead Last that require a much more covert approach to thinking about things. But you start looking at how those games do that. Now you're not gonna be able to make a deadlift from Secret Hitler to a game for the State Department. <laughs> right? I'd be impressed, I'd be awesome, but I don't think you're gonna do it. Right? But you have to start thinking about, well, how does this game work? in terms of the mechanic, and can we, res we call it reskinning. Could you reskin the game and not make it about uh, the rise of the, of the uh, National Socialist Party in Germany in the 1930s, and instead make it about uh, emergent democracies or a government which is on the border of flopping authoritarian? And it's not like there's not a few of those floating around. And you could start to steal some of the mechanics of that game. And you never tell people where you got it, by the way. <laughs> you never share that, right? Because it kills your credibility. There was an Army War College, Army War College? No, straight up, uh, game that was, the Army was doing. And the adjudication engine was a World War II uh, Panzer War in North Africa game that they were using the rules for, you know, behind the curtain. Uh, and they had basically just taken the rule set and modified it for whatever modern war thing they were doing. But that's what they were using. Their whole simulation engine was a hex map with dumb little cardboard counters on it. And they were just using the rules from Panzer Attack 42, you know, kind of thing. Now, they didn't tell the players that. <laughs> and they dress up the results, right? The theater of a game. But you can make a lot of shortcuts and, and capitalize on the intellectual power of a lot of sharp game designers 
when you can find commercial games and find mechanisms in commercial games that you can bend to your own purposes. So that's thank why I you. extol people to play games. Thank you so much. Hmm? Dead last was good. It's a good party game. Husbands and wives don't get along well in dead last. <laughs> All about assassination. <laughs> What else? Anything else? Nope, I've got to get going, but thank you very much. I appreciate the extension to, um, you know, to sock pack to let, to let me kind of, I hope I didn't uh, um, okay. take too much of your time. So yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yep, certainly. Take care. Yeah, so again, it, other topics or to be, you saw my laundry list there, which is really just me grabbing other bits and pieces that I would normally talk about over, over the uh, two, two and a half, three days that I've got uh, my part of the Wargaming course. Um, the Wargaming course does try to cover everything from, um, it, it tries to kind of follow our project management cycle in terms of you start off with a concept and you move to the international, the uh, intermediate, or I'm sorry, the initial planning conferences with sponsors. What happens by the mid planning? execution, analysis, archiving of data. Um, it tries to kind of follow that arc. Um, it does it to various degrees of success. Um, <clears throat> I talk to the design section and I talk to the adjudication section. Other speakers do a far better job of talking at some of the other parts of the process of development analysis and whatnot. Um, but the ones I threw in that front slide, um, I can talk to almost any of those. Uh, and I can make up stuff I don't know. So again, if there's any interest, Robert, again, as we talked about, if there's interest in that pandemic game brief to understand how that worked um, and how that was organized, because it is, it is I, I approached that one from a design perspective. How did we think about and arrive at the game we did, given that it started off as a game at NDU for senior officers, and it ended up being a very effective game for undergrads. Um, and if anything, the undergrad game was eerily prescient of current conditions. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? I think we're going to have a lot of requests for uh, <laughs> future programs. Um, but there is, uh, I think, some particular, you might talk a little bit about it, interest in uh, looking at pandemic games, I think. Yeah, yeah. because yeah, because the, the Moores ran a course in April. And it was a two day, two day a course on pandemic gaming. Their game, their pandemic game was very tactical. It addressed those sorts of um, immediate discovery of a pathogen uh and it's sort of like if you were playing all this in wuhan back in november that's what uh they focused on so and, and it had a little bit of a bioterrorist slant to it as well because what happens when you think this incident is actually intentional and just not nature trying to get back at the humans right um whereas the pandemic game that we designed because it was originally designed at the national defense university it was about governmental response to pandemic regional responses. Um, so it's a much grander scale uh, than the, the Moore's game uh, was designed around. Uh, likewise, uh, another part of the War College uh, did a game here uh, that's getting some attention end of last year. Um, there was a regional, uh, it was a bacterial outbreak in kind of, a, it was of an African, not, not a viral Ebola type of event, but it was bacterial in nature. But again, that kind of thing that it, there was a hot spot in a particular city and how were they trying to deal with containment and whatnot around the city. It never got to the point where it was pandemic. Uh, whereas the game that we did for, for, the, for Dartmouth was a uh, global pandemic. We don't play the global part of it. We don't, we don't, outside of CONUS, the disease is just raging. Uh, it just represents a threat vector towards the United States. How does the US then respond? And about the only thing we got wrong uh, got wrong. We didn't include was we didn't we didn't think about the uh, the PPE problem. We got a lot of other parts from scarily right, <laughs> but we didn't get the PPE right, um, or we didn't foresee that as being a factor in the game. But yeah, the, we again that's only about a forty five minute talk or so, um, and I can show you the models that went with it. Yeah, and I, and I, I'm sure there'll be a great interest too in helping people think through those design issues. I mean, you met, you covered a lot here, but um, you know, just the example you gave of um, the simplified Napoleon game and, and finding little pieces and then looking uh -huh. at the links 
I think that helps people think, okay, um, how I might I do that? Yeah, yeah. And that's where um, the, probably where I cut my teeth for a lot of game design was on a website called Junior General. It's juniorgeneral.org. Junior General is run by a school teacher in Cape May, New Jersey. And his mission in life is to introduce wargaming in the classroom as an instructional tool. Now, many schools, you can't call it wargaming for two reasons, the war and the game, okay? Both, both are problematic, okay? War is not something we're supposed to be teaching in schools, especially to you know, middle schoolers, high schoolers, middle school. And what are games doing in the room? This is serious stuff. They should be doing, you know, reading, writing, and the arithmetic. So we call them historical simulations, which suddenly gets all sorts of approval. Like um, 1776, if you play that game? Not, don't know that one. Huh. It's another, it's, it's a historical simulation. We actually used it um, when we were homeschooling the Revolutionary War. Oh, oh excellent. And it's a, yeah. it plays out the, the uh, Americans. It, uh, so it plays out your, your, um, your red coats, but then you also have the, the sympathetic colonists and then you the have your American revolutionaries. You have your Native Americans, you have your French, you have your- um, Oh, excellent. Good stuff. That's right, like, and it all plays in there on territory and it's- uh, yeah. There's so much fun. Yeah. So with Junior General, because class, you think about the, all the design challenges the classroom represents. A lot of it, not dissimilar to your world, okay? Limited time. I can't do a three-day game in a, high, in a school, okay? I got to be able to, we have to think about this in minutes, okay? We have to think about these games in terms of minutes, 40 minutes, maybe two class sessions. So very limited time. Audience, um, big from a game perspective, but small overall, right? I'm talking about 20, 30 students. So... How do I keep 20 to 30 students fully engaged all the time? Okay, because if I go and give Johnny a little squad of, of, uh, <laughs> of redcoats, and those are the guys that all get shot down on the way back from Lexington, what's he going to do the rest of the time period? <laughs> He's going to be a problem. <laughs> all right? So how do I deal with that? So um, materials, they've got to be simple games that can be rapidly communicated how to play. They cannot be expensive to design or execute. Schools have no money. So these are all free print and play games. All right, so right there, trying to think about how you create games that, and in historic, the rule behind historical simulation games is that students should be exposed to the same decisions and dilemmas that face their real world counterparts without preordaining the same outcome. Otherwise, nobody plays the Confederates, <laughs> nobody wants to play the Germans, nobody, <laughs> right? So you can't, you can't have that go in that, well, the lesson here is to, is to show how the Americans win the war. It's like, no, it can't be that, <laughs> right? No one wants to do that, right? No one says picket has to go across that field, <laughs> right? But again, how do you tee up the issues of the day that you think are the most relevant ones for them to wrestle with? And then think about adjudication formats to do that. Yeah, so my, my one son, he's uh, a... Yeah, He's a business consultant. This is, you know, graduated from Penn State last year. Uh, and he was my game player growing up. Okay. He was really into games. And I can see that now uh, in the way he processes problems. He was a, uh, an econ major, took game theory in college. Um, and how he approaches real life problems now, I see, him, I, I see him playing a game. Life has become a game in the way he approaches problems and in the same way he approaches game problems. So he's my play tester for our, my, my Napoleonic game uh, that we keep passing back and forth. Uh, but again, it, those are great little examples. One of the ones I don't, Rob, did I do the, um, the monitor example in class, the Civil War Mobile Bay game? That's one I, I, I use in some classes where, again, I step people through the, how did I design the Battle of Mobile Bay game for Junior General? because it has a whole discussion about how I had to do my research into ironclads and, and maritime construction. And all my education games are twofers. They're designed to show, yes, there's a historic simulation part, but there's another secret lesson buried in them. In that game, the secret lesson is how to do engineering trade-offs, cost-benefit analysis. Because the kids are asked to design their own ironclad as the first part of the game, then fight that ironclad in the environment with Farragut in the in Mobile Bay. One teacher has taken that a step further and they have a 3D printer. So the kids don't make paper ironclads. 
they 3D print their ironclad and then play it. They learn design skills, engineering trade-offs, 3D printing, historic. Wow, what a school I need to do have gone to that school. <laughs> That's awesome. Listen, Pete, I'm going to have to hop off, but um, thank you so much. This has been super, super helpful. And Robert, expect a long email from me after this. So. <laughs> And, uh, thank I you have, so much. Yeah. Yep. I have okay. to go as well. Pete, yep. thank you right. so much. And Robert, nice to virtually meet you. And I'll definitely be following up with you. And just thank you so much. Bye bye. Yes, yes we'll talk. Yeah, so whatever we want to figure out what we want to do next. <laughs> I'm sure I'll get a long list. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, we're still, again, we're still work from home for the college. Um, games have been pushed off. Uh, so I, I can accommodate just about almost any time schedule. Um, there are some times that are, just are better than others uh, in terms of because we have standing staff meetings and whatnot. Um, next week, Thursday, Friday, the following week, Thursday, Friday, I'm supporting a distant game for uh, the Center for Naval American or uh, New American Studies. So those are out. Yeah. Um, but short of that, you know, again, we can. I'm sure we can find some time and and whatever. And if someone wants to do a topic that like if someone wants to get into analysis, then I'll reach out to like John Scott Logel or one of those guys, John Scott would be the perfect one to do it and invite them to do one of those. Because again, the stuff I put on the slide is stuff that I can do pretty much so off the cuff. Anything else, then we may need to look at some of the resources. And in part, you're becoming my, uh, my data point for a conversation we've had about the course and offering it online. Oh. So we haven't. Um, and it's been strictly, and again, COVID-19 has forced a lot of people to rethink the, the telecommute, the online environment the type of thing. And, uh, there was just, you know, between the game schedule and the lack of a demand signal, while we've toyed with, you know, do we make YouTube videos? Do we make this type of stuff available online? But it's just been kind of like, eh, you know, but there's been no real genuine, uh, attempt to do it or demand signal around it. So, except now. <laughs> Yes. Well, I was also going to mention when you were uh, talking, um, in adult education, there's an entire field of study on distance education. Mm -hmm. And there may be some models in there that will help um, translate or maybe give you new ideas about approaching parts of the games. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, look, I see you. Got, is that you? You got your, you got your, your name tent back there. I do. <laughs> I like the logo so much there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, reach out whenever you kind of get whatever feedback you get and we'll see what we can do. Well, I could just say personally, I'm really interested in the bad games uh, uh, briefing yeah. as well. Yeah, um, game pathology. Because I think uh, we're more likely to run into that. Uh, uh, and just as a warning sign, like, uh-oh, we're heading down that uh, road of yeah. uh, not what we should not be doing. Yeah, yeah, that one I do both. So there's the war game we call war game of pathology where we look at where the where games go off the rails, how you can recognize games that are off the rails, kind of like a checklist type stuff and there's some resources. And usually we tell people that that we don't arm you with this so you can go and crap on somebody else's game. Yeah. Yeah. It's to go and see where the where you know where the potential flaws are and how you don't do that in your games. I mean, I learned more about I hate to always say this because it sounds bad for the Marine Corps, but I learned more about bad game design by going to a Marine Corps game uh, shortly after I came on board of the War College. And I had people tell me about pathology, but I didn't really understand it until I was there going, huh, they're doing that thing they're not supposed to do. <laughs> and I see why, because you're yeah. in. Um, and we also do, as a case study, we can look at Millennial Challenge 2002, which was like the, 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 the poster child for bad gaming with a multi-million dollar price tag. Uh, it was run by the Department of Defense, uh, 2002, uh, and uh, the joint then the Joint Forces Command, and it was problematic on a number of fronts. Uh, mm -hmm. We can use that as a case study. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, all stuff we can do. Excellent. Well, I'll be in touch with. Uh, yep. All your fan mail. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna stop our recording and. Yeah, and, and as far as the, the recording,